Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise your holy name, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Holy Lord Jesus, we just praise your name. Father God, we praise you this evening. We thank you, Father, once again for bringing us to this place. We thank you for this electronic ecclesia and the ability to reach out worldwide and touch people's lives, to help them stay at the ready, Father God. Help us, Lord God. Help us to manage and, and remain patient, Father, as you tarry forward into the into the future, Lord God, that we are anxiously awaiting. We are anxiously awaiting the transformation of our bodies. We are anxiously um, awaiting for, uh, the, for the calamities to come down upon this earth, Father God, and to participate in the harvest. We look upon the things that are happening across this globe, Father God. You have lifted the veil uh, before so many of us, Lord, and we praise you for that, for bringing us around, helping us to understand that we have to be practicing righteousness. For he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. 1 John 3, 7, and he who sins willfully and habitually is of the devil, 1 John 3 eight. Father, we praise you for bringing us to this point of understanding. We pray in the name of Jesus, Father God, that you will anoint us with your Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus, Father God, that you will dump down a supernatural peace which passes all understanding upon each one of our hearts and our minds. Keep us patient, Father God. Keep us steadfast, Father God. Keep us sober. Keep us, Father, trusting in you with all of our heart, leaning not upon our own understanding and in always acknowledging you so that you will direct our paths, Proverbs 3, 5. We need it now more than ever before, Father, because right now we see the, 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 the things going on across this earth, and, and in some ways, Lord, it seems a little bit like they're not accelerating quite the way we had expected. We see all of the pointers. We listen to the, your servants, the prophets. We place these things on a shelf. We keep a humble and contrite heart before you, Father God, a very hopeful, we're, uh, a very hopeful heart, Father. We're watching watching and we're praying and we're seeking you with all of our heart and our mind, Father. And we are we are so excited about the time that we have before us. Help us to remain patient. Help us to remain sober. Help us, Father God, to keep ourselves steadfast before you in Jesus' name that we can fight off the evil one. Help us, Lord God, to 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 to, to stay to continue to practice practice righteousness and to stay uh with our heads down, Lord, faithful to e watching for everything that is happening across this earth, faithfully um, you know, remaining obedient to you, Father God, in every possible way as we see these things start to unfold. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you will create in us a clean heart, O oh Lord, that you will renew within us a steadfast spirit of the joy of our salvation that you will empty our cups and fill them with your Holy Spirit. Fill them with you, Father God. Dump down your Spirit upon us. Present for us, Father God, uh, uh, the rhema word. Place it upon our heart and give us a spirit of boldness to witness to the people that are within the realm of our influence, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Father God, that you will help us to overcome any sin, any temptation, any addictions that we may still have in our lives, any sins of the heart, Father God, that we may still have in our, within us, Father. Reveal before us, Lord God, before it is too late, the behaviors that we have within our lives, Lord, within our hearts. Help us to confess of those sins because we know that if we confess of our sins before you, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, 1 John 5.18. And we praise you for that, Holy Father God. 1 John 1, nine. praise your holy name. Father, help us to overcome the sin in our lives. Any of us that are struggling, Father God, that are struggling with porn, that are struggling with uh, hateful behaviors, hateful judgmental behaviors against our fellow brothers, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that you will dump down a cup of love upon each and every one of us. Fill us with a deep, deep love and humility for every one of our, our fellow uh, workers in the kingdom, Father. Help us to endure the weaknesses that each one of us have help us to cry when others when when others of when when others that are part of the body of Jesus Christ cry and when when others are joyful help us to be joyful with them give us that heart of humility help us to see things through the heart of our king Jesus for we are crucified in Christ and it is no longer us who lives father but our king Jesus who lives through us 
Lord God, I lift up every listener of this radio show at this time, Father, and I pray in Jesus' name that you will dump down a powerful hedge of your protection, a blazing white hot holy fire to surround every one of us. Lord God, we pray as the things start to get ugly. Lord God, whether it be difficult or, or impossible, apocalyptic uh, hail storms, Father, that are falling, be falling the earth, whether it be fire storms, whether it be flooding, wherever people are in this, and in, 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 in wherever these things are happening across the earth, Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will send your angels to take charge over our lives, that you will send extra angels, Father God, to hold the branches of the trees up away from our houses, that you will surround round about each one of our, our cars as we are driving to work. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord, and like the rivers of water, you turn it wherever you wish, Proverbs 21.1. And we ask you, Lord God, to change and turn the hearts of those who have influence over our lives supernaturally, Father, as part of that hedge of protection that we are asking for. Help us to keep our hearts and minds stayed on things above and not upon this earth. Colossians 3.3 3. Protect us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these, Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Colossians three twelve through fifteen, Peter three thirteen through seventeen, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Peter three, thirteen through 17. James 4, 11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother judges his brother and speaks evil of the law and judges the law. James 4, 11. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is the most exciting time to be alive since the foundations of the earth. Everyone thinks so except Kenneth. Right, Kenneth? Hey, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited. It is, uh, it's an amazing time to be alive. Such a time as this, like we always quote from the Bible. You know, this is like the culmination of his story. The story of the Lord Jesus Christ woven as a scarlet thread through every book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's so exciting. And, you know, we, we stand here, partakers of the precious promise, like the writer of Hebrews said at the end of Hebrews 11. And all those saints at the beginning of Hebrews 12, they're standing on the balcony, looking down, cheering us on. And you know what? There's not a better time to live because we have the precious promise. We have the mystery of the ages, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And they're cheering us on right now, Johnny. And we're running this race, and we need to finish as overcomers. Amen? Oh, amen. Praise God. Well said. Amen. 
Uh, and uh, you know, no matter what, no matter what, even if the Lord tarries past 2015, which heaven forbid, I'll be you know probably drooling on myself in some you know Jesus Christ mental word for the you know uh, uh, you know endlessly hopeful, uh, but. <laughs> Praise God, but you know what? No matter what, if the Lord tarries, we have to tarry with him. No matter what. Praise God. I do not think that's what's going to happen, uh, but praise Jesus. Uh, and it, it certainly does not appear that way, which is exceedingly exciting. The list of godly people that we have right now is so huge, and we covered a lot of that with, with Pastor Levy on, on the prior show. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different data points from different sources that are all pointing to this, this possible timeline of 2015, 2016. I mean, that's without even touching upon... Uh, three quarters of the bullet points that are brought forth in the book by Thomas Horn entitled uh, Zenith 2016. Praise God for his work. So, um, you know, when you add it all up and you look at all of the godly people that, I mean, we've got uh, the Billy Graham prophecies. Now, Brother Graham is still with us to the best of my understanding. Kenneth, is Billy Graham still here, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I mean, I'm not so. sure, but I don't think I think he's still here, right? I didn't see a headline that anything. I mean, we there for a while there were a lot of headlines coming out saying he was kind of not doing real well, right? Don't you remember that? Oh yeah, his son Franklin was actually talking about his decline, but uh, you know, the Lord's timing's perfect, brother. And when we finally get to see it, we're going to understand it. And we're just going to go, aha, now I see. So I know it's all going to work out perfectly. And I know there were those visions and dreams and prophecies concerning, I guess uh, you could call him one of the pillars of the faith or one of the oaks when that oak tree falls, so to speak. But, you know, the Lord's timing's perfect, Johnny. And I just know it's all going to work out. And we're going to go, oh, I get it. Now I see how it all fits together. <laughs> well, I'm I'm kind of putting together my little Arnold Horshack questions for when I get there, you know, because I I still got a few, and 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 I'm gonna I'm sure my little question I'll be like in the back of the room, like on Welcome Back, Cotter, going oh 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 me me oh oh, you know, because it's like because you know, I have a bunch of questions, and I'm hoping that I don't end up putting too many more questions on that list. I you know I'd like to believe that we're pretty close to understanding what's around the corner. Um, the list is really huge. Um, we've got Pastor T.D. Hale. We've got God's Healer 7. We've got uh, the Sarah Manette visions. I mean, you know, we the, the, the one that's really, I really, really would have a hard time. I mean, yes, it's possible that Obama could, you know, there could be a, a martial law event in the United States, and then he could extend, heaven forbid, extend his, his presidency, and all. Oh, then the whole T.D. Hale thing drags on, and I don't know. But let's just pray that that doesn't happen. As a matter of fact, this Friday we're going to have a prayer vigil. Uh, uh, as usual, and uh, and join us there, and we will we will lift up we will lift our holy hands before the Lord, and we will pray in the name of Jesus that He doesn't tarry on uh, Pat any longer than that. Um, there is nothing wrong uh, with praying that the Lord comes. Praise Jesus. As a matter of fact, um, there's everything right with it. As a matter of Kenneth, this is an actually an excellent segue into that uh, thing that the Lord placed upon your heart regarding hastening the day of the Lord. Would would you go ahead and talk about that now? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, we got some really, really crazy news, and we know how the, 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 this all comes together, and we know there's going to be some ugly time. But, you know, God knew this, and he moved like the wind through his apostles and prophets. And Peter, Peter wrote to us in, in the second letter, chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, in particular, verse 12, he, he, told, us, he told us five things we could be doing as we wait. And we all know, look, because Paul's told us that how many times in so many of his letters. So, so Peter starts in verse 12, looking for, and then he says, hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So if you look at that word hastening, and I did it, and I, I, I really love this book written back in the 1800s by a professor of theology at Union Seminary up in New York. His name was uh, Professor Vincent. And it's called the New Testament Word Studies. And if, uh, listeners, if you want a really cool book, it's kind of a cross between a commentary and a lexicon. It just kind of explodes the verses. Listen to how he talks about this verse and what the word hastening means. And here's how Vincent, uh, an expert in Greek, how he puts it, causing the day of the Lord to come more quickly 
Did you get that more quickly? How? By helping to fulfill those conditions without which it cannot come. That day being no day in inex- ex inex- can't pronounce that word, you know, fixed or set in cement, but one that arrives which is free for the church to hasten on by faith and prayer. Remember what Jesus said when the gospel is preached unto all the world in Matthew 24? Then I'll return. You know, there's still 140 tribes, I think it is, in China, these little tribal communities that haven't heard the gospel yet, and over 4,000 in India. So we have a part we can do. If you can't get out there and evangelize, you know what you can do? You can support the missionaries, and you can pray if you can't afford to support them. And the most powerful thing we can do is pray. So there's two things we can do there. We can look and we can labor. And then in verse 14, he tells us to live for his coming without spot or blemish. And then he goes on in verse 15 and tells us to learn of his coming and not be led away by the apostates and all these false teachings. So we need to be staying grounded in his word. It's so exciting when you stop and think about it. We actually have a part we can play in it. We can hasten his coming by prayer, by missionary and evangelical work. And if we can't if, if, if we can't do, well, we can all pray, but if we can't do the evangelical work, then we can support the people like Sammy that are out there doing it. So it's so so awesome that we actually have a part to play in his return, isn't it, Johnny? Well, yeah, and it's even bigger than that. I mean, that that's huge, What and, and that's really, really well said. But there's uh, recently there's much, much more than meets the eye here. Um, for example, we had the, uh, uh, the article slash news report that we read, I think, on the prior show, uh, whereby uh, there are a stupefying number of uh, Muslims and various people across the world uh, in different countries uh, that are coming forward in large numbers and saying – that the Lord God or Jesus, either the Father or Jesus himself, has shown up before them in a dream. So, uh, And then you also have this other supernatural uh, dynamic that's been occurring now for a long, long time. I have a number of testimonies in several of the books which I've been reading. Uh, not, uh, the one written by Bruce Allen uh, uh, ha- has a bunch of information on that. Also, David Hogan um, um, has had it happen to him there's a number of testimonies so you have this par- there's two different paradigms happening that are supernatural that but so there's this so to to be clear on what i'm saying a lot of people think that preaching the gospel to people in all the different places of the earth is a somebody has to show up and they go walking in with the bible and they preach the gospel that's not what that means see that that's part of what it means, but what it's more than that. Now we have the translation dynamic where David Hogan had, and he's just one of hundreds of different pastors and and evangelists all over the world. Uh, it happens t- typically happens a lot in Africa, whereby these guys will wake up in the early morning. They'll do they'll preach the gospel uh, in uh, in in one part of the country, and they'll walk. I don't know how. It's like it's a it's a miracle, and they they show up in another part of the country, and then in another part of the country in another part of the world. They're actually translating. They're moving through time space and they're going to places that I guess in some cases they don't even know where they're going. So you have that dynamic. Then you also have the supernatural dynamic where we're getting the bunches and bunches and bunches of testimonies of people who are seeing Jesus. Jesus is showing up. So you've got these places and parts of the world world where uh, there's no, you know, there's never been any gospel preached and then Jesus shows up in front of them either supernaturally as, you know, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. All I know is that the testimonies reflect that either it, it, as a dream or some kind of a supernatural vision, uh he's showing up and talking to these people and leading them to to the kingdom, and then they in turn are giving their lives to Jesus, and they are getting Bibles, and they're going out into the into and becoming disciples to the people in their local villages. So we've got this supernatural dynamic that's mushrooming out in in a, in a fabulous way, where God is just dumping His supernatural spirit down upon all flesh right now. I think it's the early uh, beginnings of the harvest that's about to unfold uh, here, pretty coming up pretty quick. I mean, folks, I mean. Just look at all of the things that uh, that are going on in the world right now. As a matter of fact, speaking of which, listen to this. This is uh, I can't I can't give you the name of this particular uh, uh, YouTube video, 
because it's in Russian. <laughs> but I can play it for you. And this just came out yesterday. Listen to this. All right, praise God. So the point was made. Basically, that was somebody uh, that basically that was somebody with a microphone and a video camera. And if you saw the video, and I, like I said, I wish it's in the show notes, folks. If you go to show-notes.info or tribulation-now.net, okay, and you can get a copy of the show notes. God bless you, Brother Lee. We haven't said thank you, Brother Lee, for a long time. God bless you, and thank you for helping out Jonathan Collects Ministry. You are amazing your work is amazing brother god bless you but if you get a copy of the show notes you can get you can get a, a link to that youtube video um and uh it 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 you, there's tracer bullets and all kinds of stuff going on folks it's like a full almost i don't know if you want to call it a full blown war situation going on but it sure seems like a full blown war situation going over uh in uh the um uh ukraine area and syria Syria is really bad off, folks, really, really bad off. That's another place, by the way, where there's all these supernatural revealings and materialization of Jesus in front of these people who have never heard the gospel before, and it's spreading like crazy in Syria. Praise God. That and also in Japan it's happening amidst all of the Fukushima stuff. Kenneth? Yeah, John, when you were talking about these supernatural occurrences, and some people may, you know, scrunch up their nose or say, what? You know, like when David Hogan was translated. Well, remember when Philip had his encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch in, in Acts chapter 8. Yes. And, and we know that all happened. Then when it was done in verse 39, it says, and when they were come out of the water, that's after Philip baptized them, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So the Lord does things like that. And then remember when Jesus appeared to the two on the road, and, and they were all bummed out after the resurrection. I think it's in the Gospel of Luke. And Jesus appeared to them and showed him the Christ in all the scriptures, but didn't reveal himself to them. He kind of just let them see Jesus in all of the scriptures. And then they sat down and broke bread. And then they realized who it was, and he just disappeared. So Jesus does appear to people like that, and the Holy Spirit of God does translate his agents or his emissaries or his missionaries. He does that. He picks them up and he moves them somewhere else because when Philip got the call to witness to the Ethiopian who took the gospel to Africa, he was in the middle of a crusade, a, a revival, and <laughs> he had to get back to it. So the Lord said, we can't waste any time. Picked him up and took him back. That's what I suppose. The scriptures don't tell us it, but that's how the Lord works. It's exciting, John. And this culture we're in right now has forced us to deny everything supernatural. We have to say no to it because that come right out of the pits of hell. Amen. Praise God. And yes, and, and, and further supporting that is uh, the book by uh pastor bruce allen entitled uh gazing into glory uh and that's just uh, there's so many there's so much so much so much praise god thank you jesus okay and this is sent in by brother jeff um this is about we are to be fruit inspectors this is in response to the article uh, uh that i wrote on the front page of tribulation now uh praise jesus and um it's 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 really just an excellent uh uh, uh email from one of our listeners, and I and um, very worthwhile to read this. Praise God. He says, John, I enjoyed your recent article, Judging the Fruit of the Tree. I totally agree with you in regard to the lack of observing the message provided by God through someone God is using. I have often referred those who do this as biting sheep. When I re read your article, it reminded me of Dr. J. Vernon McGee and his message on judging others. He stated, we are not to judge, but... We are to be fruit inspectors. It is so disheartening to hear from so-called Christians that slander or biting of any minister or preacher or pastor. Everyone is either a false teacher or a heretic in their eyes. Unfortunately, we are all sinners, and we have all sinned because we are sinners. But isn't 
uh, isn't it great that God has used liars such as Abraham and Jacob and murderers such as Moses and David and Saul to spread his word and perform great things through them. Reading the Bible, I am so grateful that God worked through people such as David and Moses and Noah and Jacob and Solomon and Abraham and Paul and Peter and James and John and Rahab and Jonah and such. Uh, if they all were like Daniel and Joseph, I would have such a difficult time relating in how God could use me. Wow, excellent point. Can you imagine if, he goes on to say, can you imagine if David, Moses, Noah, Jacob, Solomon, Abraham, Peter, Paul, James, John, Rahab, Jonah were judged as others judge pastors, preachers, and prophets of the day? Who would be in the Bible? David, a murdering adulterer whose children were incestuous molesters and liars. Moses lived the luxurious life of the Pharaoh and committed murder and ran away to escape punishment and became uh, and came back declaring he had spoken to God. Noah was seen drunk and naked, and have you seen his grandson Canaan? <laughs> well said. And he goes on to say, Jacob, the list is too long on him. And Solomon, need we go there? Hundreds of wives and still needed concubines. Abraham, how many times was he willing to give uh, his wife to another man? By the way, did he marry his sister? Didn't he marry his sister? Uh, and I hear he got someone else pregnant and sent her packing. I think his nephew is gay or because he lives in Sodom. Oh, maybe he's, 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 he's musing at the possibility. But anyway, and he says about how many Christians did Paul mur murder and, um, and, and Peter in his denial of Jesus and James and John, sons of of thunder wanted to be treated as royalty he goes on and on and on praise god what an excellent he says john i truly appreciate your ministry i listen to your podcast and i have been fed by each message i concur with you uh, on us being good bereans and searching the scriptures daily to see if it is so i have a few pastors that i listen to and enjoy their bible studies and your ministry always allows me to seek the meat and the potatoes of the Bible and explore the mysteries that others fail or are afraid to tackle. I always remember to never put my trust in pastors, preachers, priests, popes, prophets, or people because they will fail you. Only to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who will never fail you. And he goes on to say, keep on spreading the good news and, and, and uh, accept the blessing of my proclamation. May God bless you, Ken, Kathy, Zen, and Jonathan Kleck, your brother in Christ, uh, brother Jeff. Praise Jesus. And uh, uh, so anyway, um, what, what a... That's awesome. Praise Jesus. Thank you so much, Brother Jeff, for sending this in. Um, you know, it has been a rough last couple of weeks. We have had a... Um, well, a rather remarkable number of snarkograms. <laughs> Praise God. So uh, thank you, Jesus, for you know helping all of us to endure the snarkograms, the snarkosaurusograms uh, coming in. Um, you know, there's uh, pe there, it's amazing how people believe with all their heart that they can judge a brother, they can be disobedient to James 4:11, they can they can judge. They judge not that ye be judged, but they can judge, and then they call it. They put the label of discernment on it, and uh, it's just it's heartbreaking. Anyway, we are to be fruit inspectors. J. Vernon McGee, praise Jesus, Kenneth. That was well put. Yeah, Jeff did a awesome job, and you know, think about it. I, well, he made that comment about Joseph and Daniel. I was thinking really hard. Are there any others? that didn't have that sordid past like David and, I mean, Moses. Moses had three segments in his life, and he didn't become that righteous judge until the third 40-year segment, from an 80-year-old man until the Lord took him home at nearly 120 years old. I mean, John, he didn't get it right in the first 40 years. He didn't get it right in the second 40 years. That's when he struck the rock. It wasn't until after, after that that the Lord finally got him fitly refined. I mean, there are so many people like that. So we can't go around judging people. The Lord's working them out. How's, how does Paul say it? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's between oh, yeah. you and the Lord. Not me and you and the Lord, you know? Oh, yeah, amen. And uh, I had one, one individual commented and said, well, it's your duty to discern. You know, you're supposed to discern. It's your duty to... And I, you know what? I'm like, you know what? If I, if, if I applied that concept to every single guest we brought on the show in three years and 300 shows, most of which are over three hours in length, folks, we wouldn't have a program. 
Are you kidding me? Every single person we have brought on this show, we have things we disagree with them. Every one of them. Hey, newsflash. Newsflash. Johnny, Johnny, there isn't – you and I, you and I don't even agree on every single thing, but we agree on the major tenets of the faith once delivered unto the saints by the apostles and the prophets. And you know what, brother? That's okay. You don't divide over that. How did that one saying go? In um, unity in the majors, uh, something in the minors, and in all things love. You know, you know. Let's not split hairs, folks. Let's not split hairs. And I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to judge Johnny, and I'm not going to judge my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know how Jesus put it: deal with the mote in your eye before you deal with the speck in another's. Yeah, praise God. And, you know, we've even brought people on the radio show, praise Jesus, that, um, you know, they don't believe in the rapture. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I, and you might say, well, what's the big deal with that? Well, the reason why that's a big deal, here's the thing. If you, if you believe in, pre, here, and, and, and uh, you know, it's not something to have division over. But it is something to beat the drum over, over and over and over and over again. You have to keep on beating the drum, beating the drum, beating the drum. Why? Because if you use the metaphor of a shepherd, it's the responsibility of a shepherd to make sure that the sheep are safe and that they don't wander off and get themselves into trouble. Right? Okay. So once you get get your arms around that responsibility, okay, then... You have to be able to apply some critical thinking skills to this. If you're a pure pre-tribulation John, I'm not picking on him. I'm not picking on him, folks. I'm just using him because he's a he's a he's kind of a rock star in the minds of many people. But like in the realm of the John Hagees of the world, okay, or or, or even even Chuck Misler and Hal Lindsey, Hal Lindsey, and, and Jack Van Impey, who I dearly love. Um, the, you know, when you believe that it, that purist puristically that it's a pre-tribulation rapture, that you're going to be raptured prior to the last seven years. Before anything bad happens, when you believe that, that's okay. You can believe it if you want to. But when the calamities occur, those people are going to be horrified. They're going to be horrified. And if things happen really, 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 really fast and really bad, and the calamities come down, and the financial collapse, and electromagnetic pulse occurs, and all these things happen super duper fast, and communications gets cut off, the sheep won't even be able to go back to their shepherd and say, what's up? And many of them will fall down. And some of them will shake their fist at God and curse God. And that would be bad. So, as a shepherd, you have a responsibility to nurture those sheep and help them understand the different dynamics, different possibilities. Okay. Similarly, if you tell people that uh, that you know the, that the rapture doesn't exist or the rapture occurs in the great tribulation, which would be incorrect, it is absolutely not correct because the Bible is very clear. First, First Thessalonians 5, verse 9. You are not appointed to wrath. When is wrath? Revelation chapter 6, verse 17. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand? So at the end of Revelation 6, verse 17, which is the end of the sixth seal, the bride of Jesus Christ cannot be on this earth, or the Bible tells a fib, which it doesn't. Period. Praise God. All right. Now, that being said, why is it bad? Well, if, if, if you tell people that they're going to be here in the Great Tribulation, then they get scared. And they start becoming, they start buying weapons and doing things they shouldn't ought. You have to understand, folks, it's a spiritual battle that we, are, that we face here on this earth. The great tri- it's not about, we are not going to be cast into the Great Tribulation. The Bride of Jesus Christ will not be cast into the Great Tribulation. The Church of Thyatira in Revelation uh, 2, verse 22, is because she is not obedient to Jesus. She does not overcome. She does not repent of her sins. She does not overcome her sins. And because she is 
you know, not obedient to Jesus, it says, I will cast you into a sickbed. I will cast you into great tribulation. It doesn't say I'm going to cast you into the tribulation period. It says I'm going to cast you into great tribulation. See, that one verse alone proves that it's not pre-trib. Because Jesus isn't going to cast the other churches into the pre-tribulation period and then the church of Thyatira into the great tribulation. That's absolutely ludicrous. <laughs> Praise God. So anyway, why is that important? Because if you tell people, if you tell people that there is no rapture, what happens is then you 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 give them no hope. You you you're not telling them what's in the Bible. And what happens is they won't prepare themselves appropriately through practicing righteousness and repenting like they should be and seeking Jesus. Pray always to be found worthy to escape all these things that and uh, that are coming upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. Luke twenty one thirty six. You need to be doing that now. That's critical that you're doing it right now. And that preparation, that holy preparation of the bride of Jesus Christ through fear of God. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, 2 Corinthians 7, one. See, that is a requirement of the bride. And if people are out there saying, well, there is no rapture. Well, I'm sorry. Or, or, or it happens in the Great Tribulation. No, that's false. That is absolutely false. Two verses prove it. First Thessalonians 5, 9, side by side with Revelation 6, 17. Case closed. Argument over. That's why it's important to get these facts and figures down, folks, because as a shepherd, you know, every one of us are at some point, we're either a sheep or a shepherd in our walk. If you are going to a church or your church and you happen to be having a conversation with a couple of folks in your church or you're going to a, a prayer meeting and you're having a discussion and you're talking about these things and you take a leadership role and you start helping people to understand this stuff, then you take on a shepherd's role at that point. You see, we're all uh, either sheep or shepherd, depending on what our role is and who we are dealing with and who we are talking to. Praise Jesus. And that's a big responsibility. And, and, and you have to consider, you know, when, when the great tribulation comes upon this earth, Lucifer is going to be cast down with all of his fallen angelic beings. And he will have great advantage And that's a very bad thing. We need to wake up everybody we possibly can and help them to understand that there is an escape because Jesus is not a liar. Luke twenty one thirty six. Jesus said, pray always to be found worthy to escape all these things that come upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man and my King, the God of all creation, Yeshua Jesus, our Messiah does not fib. He is incapable of fibbing. Praise his holy name. Kenneth? Amen, Johnny. And you know, when Paul wrote his letter to Titus, he referred to it as the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's awesome, John. It's all through the Bible. And you're right. If we didn't have that, we'd have no hope. We'd be hopeless. And this is not the foundation and the rock upon which we stand. You know, we have this glorious hope. Paul talked about it in so many instances, brother. It's all over. All you have to do is have our God Most High give you spiritual sight and spiritual light to see it. Kenneth? Oh, they're Kenneth. back in, Johnny. How did you get them? Ba- get them out of the studio. Get them. Get out. Get, oh, this one's pecking at me. It's pecking my leg. Get oh, they won't bite, Johnny. They don't bite. <laughs> Oh, for crying out loud. I know you like the darn things, but, oh, praise God. Sometimes they're the only people to listen to, and the only only ones that will listen to me, Johnny. (laughs) Uh, Praise Jesus. Oh, Kenneth, you know how I've been trying to diet and everything, and I've been thinking, um, you know, eat right, stay fit, die anyway. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isn't that funny? That's funny, right? Oh, come on. God, oh, you're giving me cricket. That's not right. John, oh. John, Johnny, Johnny, I think I just had an original thought here. I, I, you know what? 
all generalizations are false. <laughs> okay. No, no. That doesn't cut it either. I'm sorry. Okay, how about this one? Honk if you like peace and quiet. All right, I got a drum. I got a rim shot. Yay, finally. <laughs> you, you, you know, Johnny, these these remind me of bumper stickers. Picture this one, consciousness, that annoying time between naps. <laughs> and then I could have while driving. <laughs> Good enough. Praise God. <laughs> it is. It is, for me, it is. There was this. Uh, I, I read this article. Now we don't have time to play it tonight, but um, I read this article that uh, uh, that was talking about this one. Um, I forget what country it was. Pakistan, India. I forget. But they they're actually having a problem with people. They're going to sleep and they're staying asleep for like several days straight and they think it's some kind of a virus or something but they don't know what's causing it and uh i was like wow man that you know i wonder if it maybe i could just fly over there and spend a week or two <laughs> you know because you know consciousness that annoying time between naps I, I could go for a six a six day nap <laughs> praise god all right hallelujah well anyway that's my, oh come on for crying out loud i can't can't win for losing. <laughs> Henrietta pushed that one. Oh no! Uh, yeah. All right. I taught well, her anyway. That. <laughs> all right. And so here's. Uh, let's go ahead and read this. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. This is from David Wilkerson. Praise Jesus. All right, praise God. Set the trumpet to thy mouth uh, from David Wilkerson, 1984. Wow. Quote, God does not need America to, to evangelize the world. We have failed in this mission. Our nation still spends more money each year for dog food than missions. There will be one last great end gathering, and it is even now happening. The gospel will be published to all the world by a great army of witnesses indigenous to every nation on earth. It is the Lord's last harvest. Even now the Spirit of God is raising up... This is 1984, folks. Even now the Spirit of God is raising up a thriving body of witnesses in China. South America and Africa will be covered with powerful witnesses from their own lands. Mexico and South America are open to the gospel and young evangelists are being raised up. They will not need mission boards, ordinations large amounts of money, or fancy equipment. They will live on pennies, as the early disciples did, and in a short time they will cover the earth with the gospel, and they will point to God's fiery judgment on his careless, rich, modern Babylon as a sign the end is near. Even then, the wicked will not repent, according to John's revelation. The rest of the world will see this awesome nuclear holocaust and remain unrepentant. Did you see that? Did you hear that? 1984. David Wilkerson. He knew that the United States was Babylon the Great. He knew that it was going to be destroyed by nuclear holocaust. He goes on to say, and I quote, Two-thirds of the earth will go on seeking prosperity, worshiping Satan, and mocking God. The discipline on America will not, be humble and re will not humble the rest of the wicked. And the rest of men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor uh, of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their Thefts, Revelation 9, verses 20 and 21. Wow. What American, uh, what American could not uh, do with all of its millions, all of its electronic gimmicks, all of its expensive media methods, the Holy Spirit will accomplish in a short time with a Gideon's army of poor and simple evangelists from third world, world countries. And the rest of the world will hear the gospel. A remnant of overcomers from all nations will be raised up in, the right, uh, in righteousness. In spite of full gospel light shining forth, the majority will turn to Satan and be given over to lust. The Bible does not say that judgment on America awaits world evangelism. 
It is only his return that awaits the fruit of the harvest. I see it so clearly. Again, David Wilkerson, 1984. Praise God. And then, as a little review, I just put this out as bullet points, and and I'm going to repeat it over and over again because it merits some consideration. Praise God. Prayerful uh, consideration. All right, but again, the Sarah Manette timeline. Now, every single prophet, okay, surely the Lord God does nothing without first revealing it through his servants, the prophets. Surely the Lord God does nothing without first revealing it through his servants, the prophets. Praise God. All right, so whether it be prophecies, dreams, or visions, Deuteronomy 18.22 comes into play. If the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, and that thing does not happen nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and thou shalt not be afraid of him. That means that prophets make mistakes. We all see through the mirror dimly. And I'm absolutely convinced that anybody who's gone to heaven has time-space continuum distortion challenges. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. Praise God. The Sarah Manette vision is powerful because it, when you look at David Wilkerson's stuff, A.A. A. Allensworth, Dimitri Dudeman, Henry Groover, the list goes on and on. All of that. T.D. Hale. Um, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, praise Jesus. All of these different visions and dreams and prophecies over uh, 60, 70 years of time. And the list is much bigger than I just mentioned. It's at least double that size. All right. The Lord, uh, you've got the Joel Brandt dream of 1937. Praise Jesus. That one's vivid and it's got tons of information in it when you take all the stuff that all of those talk about happening that the lord showed them happening and you make a list of what they are maurice sklar we had him on the show just recently was just shown an electromagnetic pulse and three nuclear bombs going off which happens to be in the sarah manette vision there's too many dots to connect it lines up perfectly it has to be coming from the throne room of god praise jesus time wise we don't know but Let's take a look. Based on the Sermon Manette vision, she has a lot of details. Libya nukes Israel. We mentioned this on the last show. That's Psalms 83, possibly. That's what she saw. She saw, uh, she saw Iran firing a nuclear missile into Israel. And they did it from Libya. All right. Then also, she sees other nukes in the air, missiles, and on the ground. Could that include the Dr. Oror vision where he sees Israel shooting two tactical nuclear weapons into the base of the Fordow facility in Iran? Could that include North Korea? Because we know North Korea is going to attack the United States, sink a ship, and then go after South Korea. And the Ed Dames people – saw a nuclear weapon associated, a detonation of a nuclear bomb associated with North Korea. I don't know. And then also, what about the the claims of a false flag uh, nuclear event uh, set off in the United States by Russia? Bottom line is, Sarah, in her vision, saw other nukes, both airborne and ground, occurring. Then she sees the financial collapse, the third seal. And then she sees chemical, biological attacks all over the world, disease, riots, chaos, mayhem, mayhem and starvation. And then she sees an electromagnetic pulse attack on the United States and Israel, both, which we didn't get from Maurice Kalar because he was shown what happens in the United States. And then she sees a horrible winter. Is that the three days of darkness? Because in the Padre Pio uh, vision – the powerful Padre Pio vision from the 50s of the three days of darkness. He said the winter was more brutal and horrible and cold and during the three days of then the three days of darkness, the six seal period, than ever. It was is like unspeakably freezing cold. Well, that Sarah saw that in her vision, and then Sarah also sees the harvest, the glory light. Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3, which is also what Sister Bonnie has been shown by the Lord. And Julie from Behold I Come. And and the list just goes on and on. Praise God. And then the final nuclear destruction of Babylon the Great. 2 Peter 3, verse 10, which Kenneth was just reading earlier. Praise God. It's so exciting. And then in the Sarah Manette vision, she even sees the earth burning. Just like the Ed Dames people do with their kill shot. That's the first trumpet. Third of the grass and the trees burn. And she sees that God's good.
good people are taken off the earth before that happens. Wow. Well, what do you know? That just happens to be Revelation 6.17. The day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? That's the last verse before the trumpet judgments occur. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. This is not a coincidence. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Kenneth? Yeah, you know, John, on the last show you were talking about types and shadows, and she saw those three days of darkness. Padre Pio had that vision of three days in darkness, and that kind of lines up with what we're told of in, uh, like you said, Revelation 6. And when Jesus hung on that cross, our King of glory was crucified between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., yet for three hours the world was in darkness and that was kind of like a type or a shadow of these three days of darkness that are coming when the sun refused to shine on all the sin and wretchedness that our king of glory died for. And, and you know, brother, it's all through the Bible like that. It was prophesied in Psalm 22 that he'd be, he'd be there in both day and night. And here that actually was fulfilled as Jesus hung on that cross between 12 noon and 3 p.m. It's incredible what's in that Bible. Oh, that Bible is so awesome. Thank you, Father God, for giving us that precious love letter. Oh, amen. Praise God. And and here, again, it's amazing. When you collect like we've been doing for years and years, uh, prophecies, dreams, and visions, uh, going back, you know, in some cases, hundreds of years, thousands of years. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, look at this. So, again, in the Padre Pio Three Days of Darkness uh, uh, prophecy slash vision, he, I'm, I'll quote you. Quote, the hour of my coming is near, but I will show mercy. A most dreadful punishment will bear witness to the times. My angels, who are to be the executioners of this work, are ready with their pointed swords. They will take special care to annihilate all those who mocked me and would not believe in my revelations. Wow. Well, that matches up rather amazingly with Isaiah 13 and the mighty ones. He musters the mighty ones from the far ends of the heaven, the Shamayim, the cosmos, outer space. Scary stuff, folks. You do not want to be here for the great... All these people out there that think you're going to be able... Oh, we're going to go into the great... You know, you know... There's going to be so few that survive, that even survive to be around, to have the choice of whether or not to take the mark of the beast. <sighs> that 500 million on the Georgia Guidestones, more and more, it's, looking, it's just looking more and more accurate. God help them. Praise Jesus. Let's hit a few of these headlines. All right. I cannot hold off any longer. I have got to read this. Newsweek comes out, and they put on the front page, uh, on the front page of Newsweek, it says, The plots to destroy America. Conspiracy theories are a clear and present danger. Did you hear that, folks? So they're targeting folks like us. They're targeting uh, the, the David Hodges of the world, the Hagemans of the world, the Steve Quails of the world, uh, any of us, the Standales of the world, any of us out there who are telling people the truth about all this creepy stuff that's going on out there, 9-11. I mean, folks, anybody who doesn't realize, at least realizes that those buildings were brought down by controlled demolition, isn't paying attention. Praise God. But then they make – see, what they're doing is they're greasing the rails. They're, they're villainizing us to the best of their ability right now as best as they possibly can. Don't even get me going on Eric Holder and his plan to, to come out and you know go against all the homegrown terrorists. It's just their way of letting us all know that they're going to put into effect the NDAA, the National, uh, the National Defense Authorizations Act of 2012. They're going to um, uh, exercise extraordinary rendition. They're going to exercise the red and the blue list. They are going to execute people. They are going to take them kicking and screaming out of their houses, and uh, it's going to be a horrible situation. 
situation, folks. Praise God. And you know what? Um, it's, and they're greasing the rails right now. That the reason why Newsweek, uh, who ultimately is uh, Reuters, is owned by the Rothschilds. They're shapeshifters, people. They are. They are not even from their their bodies are flesh bodies that have been perfectly possessed. Father Malachi Martin, nineteen ninety eight, perfectly possessed by fallen seraphim, uh, fallen angelic beings. They they are. They, it's a it's unbelievably abominable the situation they own they own Reuters and they own the AP Newswire and they own the Weather Channel news feeds they own all of this stuff they only let us hear what they want us to hear they own they they look they make phone calls I have I have proof that um, uh, Glenn Beck flip flopped. He came out um, a few years ago. He came out publicly, uh, live on uh, the Fox and Friends show, and told everybody that about the FEMA camps. Freaking out. He was nervous. He was flipping out. You could see the look on his face. He was truly shaken. And by lunchtime or sometime in the early part of that afternoon, that same afternoon, he basically recanted what he said because he got a call from Rupert Murdoch. You can believe that. His $51 million got called into, called into question. That's how they do it. Anyway, so Newsweek says, the plot to destroy America, front page, and it says, conspiracy theorists are a clear and present danger. Take that cover and put it side by side with the headline that just came out a couple of days ago with Eric Holder. Come and take me away right now. Oh, there they are. Hey, Kenneth, I think it's them. I think they're coming to take me away. <laughs> hey, Johnny, give them my address. <laughs> Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Anyway, so folks, uh, anyway, so, it, it, you know, I'm going to just read this to you. Listen to this. In 2008, no one in America caught measles, and 13,278 people contracted whooping cough. By 2013, measles infected at least 276 people in the United States, and there were more than 24,000 cases of whooping cough. Medical experts at, attribute this trend to declining numbers of people being vaccinated, in large part fueled by a belief that doctors and pharmaceutical companies are hiding the dangers of immunization to protect profits. Kenneth, is that a dirty lie of conspiracy theorists? <laughs> hey, Joni, Come you on. Know call a dirty lie. Well, let's just put it this way. Up here in Pennsylvania, and you grew up near the Amish, do you know that the only confirmed cases of autism in the Amish community are with those who have taken vaccinations? That's a documented fact here, brother, so you figure it out. What is that? What? Hey! Hey! Hey, one of them's out there right now. Outside the studio. Kenneth! Ah, <laughs> oh, just ignore him. Ah, oh. oh, crying out loud. Anyway, get, get, get. Oh, Whew. George W. Hey, Bush George. murdered thousands by orchestrating 9-11. Did you hear that? George W. Bush murdered thousands by or orchestrated 9-11, and Obama is a Kenyan national who holds a presidency illegally. That... They are holding up – Newsweek is holding that up as a conspiracy theorist and saying that we are a clear and present danger. Did you hear what I just read, Kenneth? George W. Bush, Bush murdered thousands by orchestrating 9-11, and Barack Obama, Obama is a Kenyan national who holds the presidency illegally. That makes us a clear and present danger because we're telling the truth about that. <laughs> Can you believe it? It goes, it, goes, it goes against the media. It goes against the bought and paid for media. And, and you know, Twitter. Twitter has a app out called Blue Jay. It's only 150 bucks a month, and it'll monitor sarcasm. It'll monitor sarcasm in your tweets, Johnny. The social media is now being used to control the masses. They're going to use it, Johnny. They're going to come out and use it because, you know what? They have to maintain control. <laughs> Praise God. Did, did, did you see Pelosi? Johnny, did you see Pelosi the other day? What? what? When that high school student who won that media journalist award got to go to the White House or something, and she got to meet Pelosi, and these, these kids got to ask, these high school kids got to ask Pelosi a question, and the one asked her position, her position on the NSA and, and their <clears throat> overreaching arm of... Uh, you know, spying on the American citizen. She bumbled and mumbled. A high school student tripped her up. What's going on with our bought and paid for? Oh, that's the point. They're bought and paid for. Our 
A-grade media, our news reporters, they're bought and paid for, Johnny. They don't ever have these politics, these politicians bumble and stumble, because they're part of the scam, Johnny. Yeah, amen. Praise God. The limits of debate in this country are established before the debate even begins, and everyone else is marginalized. They're made to seem either to be communist or some sort of disloyal person, a kook, there's a word, and now it's conspiracy. See, they've made that something that should not be even entertained for a minute, that powerful people might get together and have a plan. Doesn't happen. You're a kook. You're a conspiracy buff. Infowars.com, former CBS reporter, agrees that the mainstream media is manipulated and controlled by the establishment, a growing movement to sway public opinion through social media and even Wikipedia by Kit Daniels. Speaking from direct experience and with refreshing honesty, a former CBS correspondent openly confirmed that the mainstream media is being covertly manipulated by well-financed and uh, uh, financed political forces who are also trying to sway public opinion through social mo- um, media and by editing wi- Wikipedia articles. Oh, and by the way, by putting uh, uh, f- front page Newsweek articles in there to trick all the people, uh, Joe Sixpack, who's watching America. American Idol. Praise God. Uh, There you go, folks. I mean, praise Jesus. Kenneth? You mean, John, I I can't, (laughs) you you, you mean, I can't trust, I can't trust those talking heads that all go to special classes in their media schooling to speak with that special enunciation and that very authoritative look as they stare into the uh, the camera? You, You mean, I can't trust those talking heads, Johnny? Oh, Man, folks, oh, you got to read the book, The Committee of 300, at least, if you read no other book. Read that and uh, and and uh, uh, also uh, Behold a Pale Horse. Praise God. Um, and I think you probably have you, – you will meet the, the requirements of the 80-20 rule of understanding how dark the situation is. And there's a whole bunch of more books that we could recommend as well. Praise Jesus. Listen to this. Folks, if you don't think something weird is going on, listen to this. Japan on Monday, Tokyo residents woke up to the strongest earthquake felt since the Fukushima quake and tsunami over three years ago. At 5.18 a.m. local time, the 6.0 magnitude quake struck the seabed near an island south of Tokyo. Though the trembler could be felt beyond the capital region, the most intense shaking reportedly occurred in central Tokyo. At least 17 people are reported to be injured with no reports of major damage. And we've seen a lot of sinkholes, but few of them happening in real time. This one swallowed a road in Russia. Watch as a big hole opens up right in the middle of traffic. It was 21 feet across. Luckily, no cars fell in. It's believed the ground gave way because of erosion after a storm. And a powerful spring storm is causing a second day of weather chaos. The northern plains are seeing heavy rain and strong winds. This storm is also bringing tornadoes that have caused severe damage in Missouri and Nebraska. Fifteen tornadoes reported in this one state and another one in just three hours Sunday night. In addition to what you mentioned, the tornadoes and the strong wind, portions of the state have also battled record rainfall. In total, about 100 miles across the state have been affected by this weather. And to the west in Colorado, Mother Nature delivering a Mother's Day whiteout. Up to a foot of snow in the Rockies. The threat is now severe flooding with more rain falling in parts of the state of Texas in the last day than they have seen all this year. And record heat is fueling fires once again in California. This is the brew power of floodwaters in Ohio, washing away a road outside Cleveland as three feet of water poured into this high school. In upstate New York, a state of emergency after a creek flooded the village of Gowanda. Penyon, which is located in Yates County, experienced sidewalks that were completely washed out, parking lots completely destroyed, even a building that collapsed. 
countless dead bunker continue to line the shores of Shark River. So far, the Neptune Township Public Works crew has collected and disposed of 5.5 tons of the dead fish. Just a few feet away, they're dumping these fish by the wheelbarrow full into front end loaders to be hauled away to a local landfill. Tons and tons of dead men Hayden died in what the state DEP says was an unusual event of too many fish swimming into the shark using all the oxygen. An apocalyptic scene. Three days on and swathes of Southern California are still being gorged on by wildfires. Over 10,000 acres now burnt to ashes. Everything from the local Legoland to a nuclear power plant has had to be evacuated. Residents have been urged to flee as fast as possible. Flames raging as thousands of firefighters work to beat them back. Six of at least nine wildfires still not under control in San Diego County. Over 120,000 evacuation notices have been issued. More than 25,000 acres charred, one person dead. An unusually early start to the fire season. So far, California firefighters are responding to almost 1,500 wildfires, nearly double that of an average year. It's not normal. It's not normal for the moon to rise during the day with the sun. It's not normal for birds to fall out of the sky, for millions of dead fish to wash on shore. It's not normal for the sun to set in the southwest. It's just wrong. Wrong. This is disturbing. Nebraska storm. Here's what happens when baseball-sized hail strikes. And then it goes on to say that baseball-sized hail pounded homes and cars all across Nebraska. The powerful thunderstorm swept the Midwest, wreaking extensive damage, several flooding, and, uh, and even reported tornado touchdowns in some areas. And it shows pictures. Uh, folks, <laughs> these are huge hailstones. Um, uh, they are huge. They are bigger. They are absolutely larger. Many of them, in, in many cases, are larger than baseballs. Unbelievable. Uh, wow. Uh, praise God. Kenneth? I just saw a report on our local news out of Nebraska. There was a hell storm there. This car was destroyed, John. They videotaped it on their cell phone. It was horrible. These things aren't normal. Yet, in the end times, it talks about hellstones over 100 pounds, brother. No. These are types and shadows. Oh yeah, praise God. It's getting worse every year. Every year we just had the worst we had the most the worst apocalyptic winter as far as I know on record this last winter. And the summer before, 128 degree temperatures, fires, wildfires all over the country. It was unbelievable and I suspect we're probably going to have a repeat of that if not a whole lot worse this year. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Get us off this alien demon infested rock. Praise Jesus. All right, listen to this. Al Jazeera News Review uh, reveals a big rise in Saudi MERS cases. Saudi Arabia has announced a, a, a jump of nearly 50% in the deaths from the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome MERS after reexamining old data uh, that also showed the number of infections since 2012 was a fifth higher than previously reported. Uh, don't forget that John Moore just recently on 528 uh, came out and said that his uh, 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 government insider sources are, uh, it, well, ex I will quote exactly what he said. He says that the government is frantically, the United States government is frantically preparing for an election Electromagnetic pulse. Praise Jesus. We know that Maurice Sklar uh, was on our show, and recently the Lord gave him a, a powerful vision uh, uh, of, of three giant rockets. Quote, this is Maurice's vision, Maurice Sklar. Then I saw three giant rocket missiles that took off into the air. Two came out of the ocean waters, and one came from land and traveled a great distance. All of them blew up in the air. One, two, three. I lean on the word three because it's in all capital letters. Boom. Uh, in the upper atmosphere within five minutes of each other. It was uh, out near space. There were terrible nu they were terrible nuclear bombs, but the last one was the biggest, and it created a huge mushroom cloud over the Midwest part of America. Then the ground shook, and everything just went black. There wasn't any electric light coming out of any homes. Then candles began to be lit and fires, and the, a little light was seen. 
Praise God. And again, if the timeline of Sarah Manit's vision is correct, Libya sends a nuke into Israel, Psalms 83. Other nukes, missiles, and ground uh, missiles, nukes, will occur across the earth. Financial collapse, global. Chemical, biological attacks. Disease, riots, mayhem, starvation. And then the electromagnetic attack, electromag the EMP attack on the United States and Israel. Praise God. All right, and then God's Healer 7, uh, Sister Barba, uh, was given a vision, and she entitled it, well, actually, the Father actually says this in her vision, I shall silence man's machines. Praise God. And then here's a headline from Infowars.com. Are you ready for nuclear war? Play, pay close attention to Stephen Starr's guest column, The Lethality of Nuclear Weapons, uh, and he gives the link. Washington thinks nuclear war can be won and is planning for a first strike on Russia and perhaps China in order to prevent any challenge to Washington's world hegemony. Wow, that matches Lyndon LaRouche's claim, right, Kenneth? It sure does, John, and there's actually um, people hearing some of the politicians and the staff on Capitol Hill saying things like, what do we have them for if we're never going to use them? Can you believe this? They're actually oh. talking like that. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Praise God. Russia Today, NATO beefing up muscles over Ukraine crisis. Uh, uh, um, uh, and and uh, wait, NATO beefing up muscles over Ukraine crisis, a mistake. Russia. If NATO is using the situation in Ukraine to beef up its own muscles, it is a detrimental policy, And uh, said Vitaly Cherkin, Russia's ambassador to the United Nations and current president of the Security Council, urging a peaceful solution to the crisis. Okay, so basically they're pointing fingers at one another. Now remember what we said about the Newsweek article, greasing the rails for the red and the blue list, the extraordinary, extraordinary rendition where they come to your door and take you away and all that kind of stuff. Off. Um, praise Jesus. All right, well, listen to this headline. Holder, Holder announces task, task force on homegrown terrorists. Attorney General Eric H. Holder Jr. on Monday announced the creation of a task force within the Justice Department to combat an escalating danger from homegrown terrorists within the United States. The Justice Department in the news release accompanying Holder's weekly video uh, address cited a Congressional Research Service report last year that said domestic terrorists were responsible for more than two dozen incidents in the United States since 9-11. And it goes on to mention right after that, it, uh, this Tamerlane Sarnayev, shown in 2010, died after a shootout with police four days after the Boston Marathon bombing. The Boston Marathon bombing? <sighs> Wow. It's all ramping up, folks. It's all ramping up. Here's another one. Meet Directive 3020, uh, 3025.18, granting Obama authority to use military force against civilians. All right, praise God. And folks, uh, it even says it's from the Washington Times. While the use of armed unmanned aircraft systems is still not authorized, the, United, the Washington Times uncovered a 2010 Pentagon directive on military support to civilian authorities details what critics say is a troubling policy that envisions the Obama administration's potential use – it's not potential – of military force against Americans. Folks, you can believe with all your heart. <laughs> so totally. Kent State is, is a shadow of things to come. Praise God. The sky explodes over Luhansk, and Kiev blames the separatists. You heard the, the, the audio clip that I played near the, the beginning of the show, folks. They are really, really ramping up the war situation in, 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 in the Ukraine right now, folks. I, where is it going to end up? We don't know. Here's another headline. Russia Today. Kiev's indiscriminate shelling of residence, er, uh, residential areas must be stopped, says Russia. <laughs> Pointing fingers. Uh, uh, another headline. Heavy fighting rages in East Ukraine. Kiev, Kiev troops clash with pro-Russian fighters. And it goes on to give casual, casualty lists and... It, it just, and then another one. Here's another report um, from Al Jazeera again, uh, and this is supported from other headlines as well. Uh, Syria rebels step up attacks before the election, and it shows an absolutely decimated Damascus. It's unbelievable. Praise God. And then uh, one more headline before we bring on Brother Peterson. 
Uh, this is so exciting. We're so happy to have Brother Peterson with us this evening. Uh, but uh, but anyway, Kenneth, let me get you to comment before I read this last headline, because this is going to segue real nicely into bringing Brother Peterson on the show. Well, the games that they're playing, John, these are all staged. You know, we talk about it all the time, but Albert Pike, he has the uh, – he has the letter to Mazzini, and he talks about the three world wars, and the last one is going to be used in the Middle East and with some of the shenanigans going on in Syria, and now we've got the Ukraine, to bring on their new world order. It's all there. It's the Brotherhood of Man. It's the true alchemy where they take the base and they try to make it precious. And they're going to do that with man. They're working on it. That's the esoteric meaning of alchemy. And the Brotherhood's doing it, Johnny. They're doing it right now right now as we speak. So it's kind of sick, but we can see it. And this, this activity in Ukraine and Syria is all part of their plan. Yeah, amen. Praise God. And here is an interesting report, an excellent segue into this part of the show. Praise Jesus. All right. Could wormholes enable us to time travel? Posted Monday, 26 May 2014. If a wormhole stayed open long enough, it may be possible to send messages back and forth through time. Hmm. That sounds spectacular. Almost kind of like the Jodie Foster movie, Contact. I wonder, could science fiction be more like, I don't know, science fact? Hmm. Makes you wonder. Praise Jesus. It goes, a wormhole is essentially a shortcut through the fabric of space-time, a passageway that joins two separate points and through which something could theoretically pass in order uh, to traverse large distances almost instantly. Some physicists have taken this idea one step further by speculating that wormholes may exist um, – uh, may exist for which each end resides in a different time as well as in a different place. If this turns out to be true, then sending a photon through one of these interdimensional corridors could make it possible to send messages in to the past or the future. And it, and it goes on to say the catch, however, is that wormholes are not uh, are not only thought to exist for a tiny fraction uh, of a second, far too short of existence uh, to send anything through, and they discuss the feasibility of it. But nevertheless, <clears throat> it does raise a number of interesting questions because we as humans often fall short. You know, we just assume that, <clears throat> well, um, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, well, we can't travel faster than the speed of mass increases as we get closer to the speed of light, so there's no way we can ever, and then, you know, and it just can't, it's impossible. It has to be, because we don't understand it, it has to be impossible. Because we don't understand it, it's got to be of the devil. Right? Praise God. And at this point, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to try. Now, folks, I'm going to try to bring, I'm going to dial in uh, Brother Peterson. Uh, Brother Peterson has been a mentor of Kenneth's and mine. We have talked to him for many, 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 many hours. Uh, praise God, he's full of the Holy Spirit, and he's got a sanctified imagination that cannot be beat. Praise Jesus. And uh, he maps it all back at, like a good Berean to the Scripture. Now, we oftentimes, uh, li you know, lately we've been having some technological problems bridging in Skype calls. All right, so we might, I might get disconnected uh, while I'm trying to bring in uh, and bridge in uh, Brother Peterson so the show, uh, to the show, so bear with us uh, while I attempt to do that in in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and play, uh, well, we got this, you know, top secret New World Order uh, insider whistleblower microphone message or, you know, uh, tape from uh, the uh, Kenneth Beer compound. And it's just, uh, it's so appropriate that your chickens would be, you know, kind of introducing the Peterson Chronicles. There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. We will control the horizontal. We will control the vertical. We can change the focus to a soft blur or sharpen it to crystal clarity. For the next hour, sit quietly and we will control all that you see and hear. You are about to participate in a great adventure. You are about to experience the awe and mystery which reaches from the inner mind to the outer limits. Right on. You know, John, it, it is so true. 
Right on. Are you there? Yes, are you there? <laughs> we had some technical <laughs> difficulties, just like we predicted, but I think we pulled it off. Kenneth, are you there? I'm here. Hey, Lauren, good to have you on. Yeah, Ken, I'm getting a, I'm getting a delay in my headset. You sound real good there, Brother Lauren. To me, on my end, you sound, I mean, crisp. How does he sound to you there, Brother Kenneth? A OK. You know, Lauren will be doing most of the talking, so don't sweat it, brother, with the delay. It's probably because I'm on a plain old phone line, a POTS line, you know. So that might be the <laughs> delay. All right. Praise God. So anyway, <laughs> let me just go ahead and introduce um, Brother Lauren Peterson. Uh, he's uh, what we what uh, Brother Peterson, um, uh, you know, for I mean, he has been uh, what we call one of the thought leaders with Tribulation Now. Uh, for since way back to 2009, uh, when the website originally went up, uh, and um, behind the scenes, he's been a mentor for Kenneth and I, uh, introducing us to some of the deeper Bible mysteries and how a lot of this stuff lines up uh, with some of these uh, what a lot of folks uh, refer to as prophetic movies, um, and in and, and the and and some would argue that the movies out there, uh, some of them are science fiction movies, some of them are apocalyptic elliptic movies uh take your pick uh many of them you know jesus said are are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground outside of the father's will so we know uh that that uh that that the that our heavenly father keeps lucifer on a long leash and sometimes he lifts his hand of protection off of an area or a people or whatever and ba- and lets lucifer do bad things and et cetera, et cetera. but but nevertheless um we are really blessed to have brother peterson join us this evening um he uh uh uh, will uh, be a part of a regular series of shows that we're going to be doing. Uh, hopefully, now we're not prom- you know hopefully on Saturday evenings, consistently on Saturday evenings for an undetermined period of time. All right, uh, and and, and uh, now what we don't know is if we're going to be able to do every single Saturday because the, you know there'll be times when we got to take vacations and things like that. But we're always going to try to pre-record one show in advance. We've already had, and I didn't tell you, Lauren, I had to keep you on the edge of your seat, but we've already had several emails come in, and people uh, have uh, given us uh, absolutely wonderful, uh, blessed reviews uh, on the first show that we did this last Saturday evening. Um, Also, folks, just so you know, Blog Talk Radio, it puts up an annoying red uh, 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 sign up on when the show plays live, uh, the, rec- the pre-recorded show plays live, saying you know that the host has to call the show. That is not true. Just ignore it and listen. Uh, and it shows up in the archive. It doesn't show up as a show for the day. So you, you might go there on a Saturday to blogtalkradio.com forward slash tribulation dash now. You might go there and say, gee, where's the show? Where's the show? It, well, it's not going to show up until 8 p.m. when the show uh, is scheduled to show up. And it shows up as an archived broadcast, okay, unfortunately. So these are just some, you know, bugs or whatever, nuances about how 
BTR handles pre-recorded programs. Um, but nevertheless, we're going to do the best we can to get these out, and we're going to go ahead. We're calling them the Peterson Chronicles, Angel Wars and the Luciferian Rebellion. Now, that is the... That is the um, the core foundational storyline that we're going to be going after. But um, Brother Lauren will be touching upon a lot of other biblical mysteries uh, as he goes through uh, the various things that the Lord has showed him over all these years. And anyway, on that note, uh, Lauren, what's up with Star Wars? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, Star Wars. <laughs> I wanted to make a comment to uh, one of your – about those wormholes, okay? I've got a lot of wormholes out here in my yard. What do you think of <laughs> – All right. Uh, look, I, wa- have... I wonder if I can send a message through those wormholes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that does it. All right, that does it. I, I got it here, right here. All right. So you're not above. Uh, just just because you're helping us do a new series on the show doesn't mean you're above a buzzer now and then. Uh, <laughs> Praise God. All right, go ahead. Okay, it's kind of kind of difficult me difficult for me to talk because I get a three to five second uh, loop back on on what I'm hearing. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. See, I'm getting that loop back. Okay. If at some point you want to end the call and start a call and take a break for the listeners, go ahead. We'll get this coordinated. Okay, when I first start, saw Star Wars in the movie theaters in the summer of 1977, I knew exactly what it was talking about. But that's because God had prepared me through a number of books that I read for about um, two years before that. Two to three years before 1977, God had prepared me through a number of books I read, as well as his holy word, the Bible. So one of those books, the the one that blew the barn doors off my thinking uh, in 1975 was called Colony Earth by Richard E. Mooney. Shortly after reading that book, I found the book Sons of God Return by Kelly L. Seagraves, or Segraves, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. Um, <clears throat> Richard E. Mooney was a secular writer, and Kelly Seagraves was a Christian writer. Now, whenever uh, <clears throat> we live in a world of, of uh, grayscale, just like a computer grayscale, when you take a picture. In the old days, they had grayscales, and uh, thank goodness they uh, converted that to color, so we no longer have to look at grayscale, we can look at color. But behind that color is a grayscale representation. So just like in real life, we have multiple shades of gray. Within each shade of gray, each level of gray, is a certain percentage of of light and a certain percentage of darkness. And if we're going to live our lives of 100% light versus 100% darkness, then we're going to throw the gray out with the bathwater, and we're never going to arrive at the truth because we live in a world of grayscale. Amen. In in the world of ideals, it it would be nice to look at the world in pure black and white, but we do not. But that's not the world we live in. The world we live in is full of gray. Now, one of, the, one of the Bible verses that is written in the New Testament is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, that verse alone can help us to discern the grayscale that is around us every day. That verse can help us if we have the Holy Spirit in operation within us. That verse, the Holy Spirit, can help us to discern the grayscale that's around us every day that we operate in. We can figure out how much light, how much darkness. 
whatever we hear, whatever we see, whatever book we read, even the Bible itself, the Holy Spirit can help us to to discern it, to d- rightly divide the true from the false. Now, this, this verse itself has a here and now application, but it also points back and connects with Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And the more you understand the Luciferian fall and rebellion and the angel wars, and then you read through the Bible, the more and more it will come to life to you of some of the things that Jesus encountered in his life here on earth, as well as the parables he taught, as well as reading through even the New Testament. You will see amazing things just leap from the pages of Scripture that connect back to eons ago. We can take a verse like Daniel 12, verse 4. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. It is 100% clear that this verse is referring to our time. Our ability to travel back and forth has increased, and our knowledge has increased with the explosion of radio and then TV and then computers and then the Internet and satellite communications. But these words will be sealed up until the end of time. Now, typically, we view this book or this verse of Daniel as referencing a future time, which would be our time. But we can also look, take this verse and project it backwards to ancient history, that even ancient history has been sealed up until the end of time. So not only are we going to, that the uh, prophecies that foretell the future are going to explode in meaning to us, but antiquity itself will be revealed. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So so let me just ask you this question. So does this track back to Genesis uh, uh, 11, the first nine verses, where they, they, there's that reference that you had shown Kenneth and I about, um, uh, and and how does it go? And nothing which they seek to do will be withheld from them, or something like that. That's right. And their imagination. The uh, the Tower of Babel story is a uh, very little understood story. It's only nine verses in the chapter in chapter 11 of Genesis. But what, what it does say, you could write volumes and volumes of books concerning it because it reaches that. Traditionally, it, if my understanding, my remembrance is correctly, traditionally that story is, is uh, tied in with the Empire of Babylon somehow. And if we go back to the Empire of Babylon, when Daniel was in power, King Nebuchadnezzar and his son later on, there is no way... That Genesis 11, 1 through 9, could be fulfilled within the Empire of Babylon. The Tower of Babel would be absolutely impossible to occur during the Empire of Babylon. During that time, do you see a worldwide civilization? Do you see a worldwide, a unified language, a one world language? Do you see a one-world government? Do you see a one-world dictator, a ruler? Even if you go back to the Mesopotamians and the Sumerians, do you see that anywhere all over the world that there was a world dictator, a world ruler? Do you see anywhere all over the world where mankind had risen up to the point where anything within their imagination was now possible for them to accomplish?
when when I came to understand more fully, and with the help of that book, Colony, Colony Earth by Richard E. Mooney. What was in that book? You, you, you mentioned that on the first show that we did on uh, the, that we played last Saturday. I mean, can you give people kind of a summarization or a, a high level, you know, summary of what was in that book? Because that, that's got me curious. I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. to, you know what I mean? I, I've got yeah. over two hundred books lined up for myself to read. <laughs> I mean, I, what what's in that book? <laughs> okay. Do I need the buzzer? During, during that, <laughs> do I need to get the buzzer? Here, here, no. let me practice. Oh, okay, okay. Just thought I'd check. Dur- okay. During that during that time in the seventies, there was a lot of books. Eric Van um was kind of the trendsetter with his Chariot of the Gods. And a lot of other authors and researchers followed in his footsteps with their their books and their versions of what happened long ago. And basically, Eric Don Bonnikin was at the Charity of the Gods. That means the aliens aliens from outer space came here and uh, modified uh, the apes to create a pre-human type of creature and modified that to become a primitive worker. And uh, eventually, we evolved into what we are today. Richard E. Mooney comes from from a perspective that perhaps Adam and Eve were seeded here from somewhere else out in outer space. That they were original astronauts that landed on Earth. That's that's his take, and 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 uh, humanity evolved from that original Adam and Eve that came from somewhere else in outer space. <clears throat> kind of like the two little kids who got taken to the other planet at the end of the movie, uh, knowing with Nicolas Cage. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't believe in. You can read read a book and. These types of books have all kinds of facts that they they put out that are uh, in, indisputable as far as facts go, but you don't have to agree with the conclusions that the author arrives at. If we take a brief moment to look at when Satan confronted Jesus out in, after the 40 days in the wilderness, Satan used scripture three times to tempt Jesus. And Jesus countered three times with Scripture. Satan used Scripture and took it to the wrongful conclusion to try to trip Jesus up. Jesus replied with Scripture to set the record straight onto the rightful conclusion. Okay, so right there... We have scripture versus scripture. One is uh, unto the wrongful conclusion, and one is unto the rightful conclusion. And in my background in going to churches uh, in, in past years, I've been to churches where they preached the pure word of God out of the Bible, but it was with a spirit of condemnation. I was constantly, uh, uh, also in other churches that preached out of the same word of God, the same Bible verses, but preached a spirit of liberty. Now, which church do you think would have the most potential for growth? (laughs) And which church do you think would have the most potential to run people and their faith right in the ground under legalism? All right, so when you read a book, there are going to be facts presented and then there will be concluding arguments. And you don't have to believe in the concluding arguments. So when you read a book like Colony Earth, the author is going to present certain facts, but he's also going to present his theories and his concluding arguments. So as far as humanity being seated here from somewhere else, that sounds plausible in the way that he presents it, but I believe in the the way the Bible presents it. I'm holding out for the way the Bible presents it. However, one of the things that he presents in his book is that long ago mankind had possessed perfect memory recall. And one time long ago, mankind lived long ages. One time long ago, mankind enjoyed a super civilization, which they had a war, and society collapsed from that war, and where evolutionists would say that that mankind 
evolved from from uh, primitive uh, from apes and came out of caves and started uh, being in the hunt hunter gatherer and then evolved into uh, crops you know being farmers. What this author is saying that the reason we came out of the the reason we were in the caves to begin with is the same reason is if what we're staring right at the face today is World War III and later on Armageddon. Now you take today's society and you blow it to smithereens and what do you get? You get a total collapse of technology, a total collapse of, of society. People have to resort back to living in caves in any way that they can. They're going to be hunt. They're going to become hunter gatherers because they're going to feed off of animals to begin with until they can get to a certain to, to extent where they can stabilize the environment to grow crops, and then you have farmers that take hold. So as we we look into our own future, what would happen if we had a global war conflict? It's already happened before, folks. That's what this author is saying. And that was like blew off and a, a number of other things. That blew the barn doors off my thinking because it ties right back in to the Tower of Babel. So when you consider that the people back during the Tower of Babel had that kind of power, that nothing within their imaginations would be impossible for them to accomplish, that's talking about absolute power. Yeah, I believe it was Ron Skiba who we had on the show who was talking about, I mean, there's some pretty unbelievable green emerald technology things or whatever that I, I, I wish I could remember what he had said, but he had brought forth some stuff from some ancient writings about that time period where he, I think, I think it was Rob, where he had hypothesized or postulated that uh, the Tower of Babel or Babel or whatever was actually some type of a, a time machine or something like that. I don't know. I, I, I but anyway, really fascinating. Yeah. When, when you look at when you look when we we consider the technologies that we have today, and then we look at the uh, the deep government labs that have stuff that's a hundred, two hundred years ahead of what what we have publicly. Okay. What we are looking at today is the re-emergence of tower technologies, the rebirth of the Tower of Babel. And as Nimrod back then was the world ruler, <clears throat> he was the Antichrist of his day. So as we look at the potential for the Antichrist rising in today via biblical prophecy, there was once upon a time long ago another Antichrist that rose to world prominence and the stargates were opened. Genetic experiments were already being performed of mixing and matching and ultimately to perfect the human race, mankind, to regain what was lost during the Noah's Flood, to regain the pre-flood technologies and capabilities of the human race. <clears throat> now, this, the satanic angle to this is to, re to re-wage the Luciferian war from eons ago that, that long preceded the rival of mankind. Does that, does that connect back to the whole Clone Wars, Star Wars yes, thing? Yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Can you expand on that a little bit? Cuz I never really got that completely. I mean, how does that whole, you know, cuz some people think Lucas was like, you know, talking to them, if you know what I'm talking, you know. And and, yeah. and you know what I'm saying? I mean, how does that whole clone war white robot thing tie into this, you know, paradigm? that we see, you know, because we see the transhumanism dynamic, we see the drone dynamic. I mean, and this Sunday we're, we're going to be meeting up with Zen Garcia. He's going to join us on the radio show this Sunday and because uh, the Farsight Institute people had, uh, you know, asked whatever they do, they, the, the, the remote viewing thing, they had revealed and seen uh, 
these beings, these, you know, beings that are not from Earth, uh, actually involved in the creation of the pyramids. And we're going to uh, uh, play some audio clips from that and discuss it. But it all seems to tie together and kind of go back into the whole Clone War. I mean, is it? how do you see that playing out in the future? Um, it, it, it's been a... T- it's been attempted once before during the Tower of Babel, and we could probably project back to pre-flood days that it even was attempted back then. To, be, to really understand it, you have to go back to the Luciferian fall, his rebellion, and the war in the heavens. And uh, that gets pretty deep in itself to understand all that. But <clears throat> traditionally, we've been taught that angels are just these uh, uh, beings with wings and uh, robes and uh, Floating around on clouds, streaming, stringing har- harps and playing nice music and everything. They're all pretty and, blonde uh, women, aren't they? Pretty blonde women? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> aren't they all pretty blonde ladies that, that play oh, yeah. harps? Oh, yeah. You better believe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, when, when God created... Um, you'll have to tune in to the, the, re- the regular series, but when God created... Um, Creation. He created uh, multiple universes, and within each universe, multiple dimensions, and a smorgasbord of life forms across the board. So God is pretty busy. And all this was so that mankind would have an inheritance, and so that mankind could rule and reign with his Son, his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Now, Lucifer didn't like that plan because it also meant that mankind was to rule and reign over him and everything and everybody that was under his command. Did Lucifer and look you... like Mr. Spock? I'm sorry to interrupt. Did Lucifer look uh, like Mr. Spock? Is there any no. chance? Of... No, he didn't. Oh, okay, darn it. <laughs> no. there's, there's one uh, Star, Star Trek show that um, that portrayed that, you know, and they got into that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> I forget the title of that that episode. Um, if I sound kind of broken up in talking, it's because I'm getting this constant feedback, so it makes it kind of difficult for me to hear hear what I'm saying while I'm hearing what I'm saying five seconds ago. <laughs> See, it was always God God's original intent that mankind would rule and reign with his son and rule and reign over all creation. And that included Lucifer and everything and everybody under his authority and command. He didn't like that because he was first created. Jesus constantly said on his ministry on earth that the first shall be made last and the last shall be made first. And that's like an indirect reference back to this former time that Lucifer, who was first created, would become last. And everything and everybody under him would become last to make room, to make um, way for mankind who would rule and reign with the only begotten Son over all creation. He didn't like that deal. He thought he was getting the short end of the stick after all these eons of time that he had been serving God and in the throne room of God itself, himself, being the first created and, and this high exalted creature, which you can read about in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 19, some incredible revelations right there. He didn't like that deal, so he rebelled. He fell and he rebelled. And we can also get a glimpse of this story when Jesus encountered the rich young ruler. So you can read that story in uh, the, any of the four Gospels. Basically, the rich young ruler did not like the idea of laying everything down before Jesus, giving up everything that he had for Jesus and following Jesus. So the rich young ruler walked away. And that basically reflects back to Lucifer. Lucifer had it all, but he was not willing to lay it down before Jesus. Oh, okay, so you're so you're submitting that there's duplicitous and multiple meanings behind a lot of the parables that are out there. That's right, as well as 
the people that Jesus encountered and how how that you know transpired and everything. The rich young ruler can be a sermon in itself, and I'm sure many pastors through through the ages have made sermons out of that story. But imagine this rich, rich young ruler that Jesus admired this guy because this guy had followed all the laws of God from his youth on onward. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine any of us following the laws of God from our youth on up? <laughs> Jesus loved this guy. But this guy asked, what must I do to be saved? You know, what what do I have to do? What else is there to do? You know, I've done everything there is to do. Is there something else I need to do? And Jesus said, yes, there is. Sell all that you have. Give it all up to the poor. Take up your cross and come follow me. And that's reflective backwards to Lucifer because he could not, he refused to give it up. He refused to lay it down before Jesus. See, what Zen Zen is, one of the things Zen has brought forth, Zen Garcia, is that there was a transition to be made. Up to this point in time, Lucifer was the high priest, and I know a lot of people will get bent out of shape at this, but you can read it for yourself in Ezekiel 28, verses 12 and 13, specifically 13, which speaks of the nine stones that were inlaid into Lucifer's breastplate. What that's saying is Lucifer was the living ephod before the throne of God, and as the living ephod, he was the high priest of creation up to that point in time. But there came a point in time where there was going to be a change in the priesthood. God the Father was going to bring forth his only begotten son, Jesus, to become the high priest over all and to usher in mankind to rule alongside as brothers and sisters and as kings and priests alongside of Jesus to rule and reign over all that the Godhead had created. That was always God's original destiny for mankind. And Lucifer did not want to bow down to that. It's one thing for him to bow down to Jesus when he was the high priest, but he did not want to re- he didn't want to give that up. He did not want to give up everything that he had and that he had control over. So he fell he fell away, and he rebelled, and he started a war. When we look at this rich young ruler, how many people in the church today are wealthy, they're youthful, or have maybe they're older, but they have youthful vitality because they followed God and his, his laws in their lives? And in one degree or another, maybe they're rulers, maybe they're, they're uh, bosses, maybe they're in a company, maybe they're, they, they're owners of a company, maybe they're in a government position, a military position. They rule over other people, and maybe, they do not want to give it up. Maybe they're on the board of directors of the church. Maybe they're an exactly. elder. Yeah, maybe exactly. they're a bishop. Exactly. I've, exactly. You know what I'm talking exactly. about? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You got it. How many people in the church today are not willing to lay it all down for Jesus? And so when? When there comes this future time that's coming upon us soon, quickly, when there is a, a separation of the sheep from the sheep, when there's a separation from the wise versions from the foolish versions, what will determine who the wise versus the foolish are? Which one, ones amongst and within the churches have already laid it all down before Jesus? And which ones are still clinging to their wealth? clinging to their positions of power and influence, clinging to their youthful vigor. But they're not willing to lay it down. And so they will be left behind and thrown into tribulation. 
Oh, uh, okay. Matthew Does that 16, make sense? Yeah, Matthew sixteen twenty five. For whoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So, yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. pretty so, much it's laying yeah. down your life for your fellow yeah. man. Yeah. Because you love your neighbor more than yourself. <laughs> yep. So you're not allowed. So when your neighbor comes knocking on your door, let me in, let me in. I want some of your food. You you, you can't shoot them. <laughs> like like a lot of all these other radio shows are telling you, just go ahead and shoot them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you got to love your neighbor more than yourself. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So some some of the uh, the wise versions that exist today have already have left the churches. Maybe some of them have been excommunicated, so to speak, been kicked out, been been disassociated with from the foolish virgins. Okay? Uh, I've gone through that. You've gone through that. Ken has gone through that. Many of the listeners have gone through that where you feel like, get me off this planet. Jesus, come now. You just don't belong here anymore. You're not even welcome within a church. <laughs> if I told, if I went to any church in America today and told what I knew, they'd probably burn me at the stake, just like the Catholics did back, back in the medieval ages. I'm sorry, <laughs> to say the <laughs> least. They'd be dragging you out. They'd be dragging you out in the parking lot like they did Jonathan Clack kicking and screaming. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, that's what it says, John 16, too. It says they will, they will kick you out of the synagogues. There will come a time when they will kill you and think they have done God a service, and they have done that's this right. because they have not known the Father nor me. That's now let's, talking about love. That's, that's right. Now let's backtrack that back to the Luciferian Rebellion. How many of those those beings that Lucifer was talking to believed his story versus God's story? And some of them were convinced, and some of them were strong-armed. But whatever the, be the case, a war happened within a star, Star Wars. We've had our own Star Wars, folks. When I saw that first one come out, come out in 1977, I knew exactly what I was talking about. We have had our own Death Star experience right in our own solar system. There used to be a planet between Mars and Jupiter called Maldek, and it was blown to smithereens. It's now the asteroid belt. From that point on, it was the asteroid belt. There used to be life, full life on Mars, teeming. Mars used to team with life. There was an atmosphere. There were oceans, rivers, streams, uh, plants, animals. And it got blown, off, blown away. Earth itself was teeming in life before this, this war happened. And all life on this planet beca became decimated. Shredded to bits. And we come to the aftermath of this war to verse to chap, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. <clears throat> and the earth became without form and was made void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the the waters upon the face of the deep upon this darkness you see folks for God is light and in him is no darkness at all so now we have a conflict here where in the world did this darkness in verse 2 come from it did not come from God this darkness was not God's plan A for his creation. This darkness was outside his sovereign will. This darkness came from Lucifer and Lucifer's rebellion. 
the war in the heavens, the original Star Wars, that took out one of our planets, ruined, ruined all life on Mars, and blew, blew away life on Earth. So, God had a decision to make. Was he going to kick back and let Lucifer have one-third of creation? Was he going to say, okay, Lucifer, you can have your one-third. I'm going to keep my two-thirds. You keep on your side. I'm going to keep on my side. The answer is no. God proceeded with a plan. He sent his Holy Spirit in first. Because darkness had never existed before anywhere. So the Holy Spirit had to go in. And that's where we come to Hebrews. That I quoted in the beginning here. Chapter 4, verse 12. The dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart of Lucifer. And of this never before Existence of darkness. This darkness was had never been in God's plan A for his creation. Now he had to figure out just what it was, what the parameters were, and how to counteract it, how to contain it, and then how to make a plan of redemption and salvation to win it back. And that includes you and me, ladies and gentlemen, to win back mankind because we are behind enemy lines. And Satan goes about as a devouring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And ladies and gentlemen, he has devoured billions and billions and billions of souls of mankind over the ages. And Jesus came to offer mankind redemption and restoration of our original destinies so we could fight back against this ancient evil, this ancient darkness that had no business to be there in the first place. Resist the devil. That is a command. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's not a question. It's not an option. It's one of our commandments is to resist the devil. You, ladies and gentlemen, are the resistance which comes out of the Terminator series, the movie, the Terminator series. You are the resistance. And Jesus Christ laid down his life so that we could become born again in him and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and receive the fruits and the gifts and the power from on high and eventually the sacred words, which, which the enemy has absolutely no defense against. The enemy can bring on all their technologies, they can bring on their, their uh, robot droids, they can bring on their clones and their clone wars, they can bring on whatever they got in their arsenal, and it's absolutely no match to God's sacred words held on reserve from in the beginning. These sacred words have never been spoken forth ever. They are primal. Primal power, the primal power of God and His Holy Spirit that have never been spoken forth, have never been unleashed. And as Mr. T would say, pity the poor fool. Pity the poor fools that want to go up against these sacred words because you will not prevail. It's kind of like so. It's kind of like Revelation 12, almost like with the metaphor of the two witnesses shooting fire out of their mouths for 1,260 days. And that they is war a big bingo. Right? Is that it? Yeah. So you 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 so got that's it. A, that's a metaphorical reference. It's a metaphor. This con- wow. That will take on a, a a real reality. This was a revelation that God gave me. Uh, 10, 15 years ago about these sacred words. Okay, so since since then I've been, you know, whenever I come across something in Scripture that, that's a bingo, yeah, that's referring to these sacred words, I write it down. So these sacred words are pristine 
They are primal. They have never been spoken forth before. And if you have sin in your life, you do not want to speak these words for, forth because they will slay, slay you right on the spot. You will be an unfit container, an unholy container if you have sin in your life. We can look in the book of Acts with um, who are those two people that they kept lying to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit slayed them? What, what were their names? Oh, uh, Ananias. Was it Ananias? Ananias and Zephariah? Yeah, I think I, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I, Ananias I and Zephariah. Yeah, yep. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, they kept lying to the Holy Spirit. And at that time in the early church, the Holy Spirit was raw and was powerful, okay? And and they kept lying to the Holy Spirit to the point where they dropped dead. They lied one too many times, and they finally dropped dead on the spot. And the fear of God went through the people. These primal words will be even more powerful, more forceful, because we, the people that are here then that receive these sacred words will be going up against these evil armies of Lucifer. They'll be going up against the droids, going up against the clones, going up against the serpents and scorpions. Remember something that Jesus said, And ye shall have power over the serpents and scorpions. He was not talking about earthly serpents and scorpions. He was talking about the supernatural serpents and scorpions from long, long ago that were involved in this original Star Wars. These serpents and scorpions, as much as demons are bad boys and are problems for the the human race and have a lot of power in and of themselves, demons are choir boys compared to the serpents and scorpions. Are these like the flying fiery serpents in in Isaiah? Yeah. <laughs> and, and worse. Are, are, are they yeah, are they all is it also like some of these creepy creatures with the 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 tails that sting and what is yeah. The, yeah, in yeah. Revelation and in, 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 yeah. in, during the trumpet judgments, the sixth trumpet yeah. where a third of mankind is killed? You want to have some idea of the uh, scorpions that will be arriving here um that will be materializing right in front of people's faces. Watch the movie Howard the Duck. And I know that sounds really funny and hilarious and ha-ha, hee-hee. But some of the most advanced wisdom is hidden in plain view in the most unlikely places. So you can look, watch the movie Howard the Duck. And for those Christians that like to look at movies with rose-colored glasses... You will be disappointed in one scene in the movie that is adult in nature, maybe two or three scenes that have an adult connotation. Please overlook that and don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Watch the movie with Holy Ghost discernment. Howard the Duck, a scorpion, is beamed, is, is brought forth from a dark region beyond the planets and materializes here on earth and takes takes the host body of a scientist called Jenkins. No way. Yeah, the host body Jenkins. Now there's this battle between Jenkins, his soul, and the soul entity of this scorpion. And because the scorpion is far more powerful Jenkins takes a less and less and less, and and the the scorpion gains more and more and more. But the plan, the technology is there, folks, to open the scar star gates, to open the star gates, to open the wormholes, and to bring those bad boys right here on Earth, right into our three dimensional reality, to rewage that ancient war. You see, some of these beastie boys. <laughs> Some of these beastie boys were locked up in prisons of darkness out there beyond the, beyond the planets. And Lucifer wants them set free, 
so they can rejoin him in this ancient war. So when this war kicks off, you're going to have a whole smorgasbord of entities to deal with. If you think the Russians are bad, if you think the Chinese are bad, you think the Koreans are bad, (laughs) they are nothing compared to what's coming after them. Ladies and gentlemen, as John has said so many times on his shows, you do not want to be here during the Great Tribulation. It's going to make the movie Stephen King, The Mist, look like a fairy tale, isn't it? That's right. That's right. Because <laughs> I, I, I always think about that movie because there's a lot of there's a lot of prophetic parallels in that movie as well. That's Remember right. the one yep. scene where the creature, the the locust creature or whatever, was crawling up the shoulder of that Bible thumping woman who was kind of a you know an embarrassment to Christianity, but nonetheless. <laughs> You know, but when but remember how she was like praying and the creature like left her alone. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's you know, it's it's Stephen King's rendition, but you know, it's like there's a lot of truth to that. It's kind of creepy. Yeah. But. So when you start start looking at go back through these movies, there's the Star Wars series, there's Star Trek from the '70s, as well as the the new uh, series of Star Treks that progressed from there. There's the, t- uh, there's the uh, uh, movie series uh, um, Stargate, and that then uh, went into a TV series, uh, Stargate Atlantis and Stargate SG-1. So many of those movies and TV series, we go back to uh, even like uh, in the 50s, they had a lot of sci-fi movies to, that today look ridiculous, but, but back then it was cutting-edge uh, special effects. But the material that they had in the, those movies was hitting the nail on the head a lot of times. And you have the um, the Outer Limits and the Twilight Zone TV series that were bringing out cutting-edge material. And most people were watching those as entertainment. But if you go back and look and watch those shows, and if you need to pray up, I would have heavily advised it that pray up, pray Ask God, ask the Holy Spirit, ask Jesus to grant you discernment to to be covered by the blood of Jesus and to watch those those things with, with discerning eyes, to rightly divide the true from the false. And God will show you some amazing things that ties directly into his holy word, the Bible. And when you go back to read the Bible, scriptures will leap out from the pages and great big bangles will go off in your mind and neon lights will appear in the sky of your mind. It's like I've read that a hundred times before, and now I finally get it. <laughs> okay. So we go back to that uh, uh, Daniel uh, chapter 12, that there, that in the last days, God is going to open up our understanding, not only for future events, but open up our understanding of past events. We go back to uh, King Solomon in the uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, where it says, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see this, it is new. Already it has existed for ages, which were before us. There is now, there is no remembrance of earlier things and also of the la- later things which will occur. There will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. Many times on your shows you have made mention that it seems like man has forgotten his past. So we go from one age to another, and we forget what was in the former ages. And we have this uh, this saying that if, uh, if we don't learn from history, we are condemned, we will be condemned to repeat it. 
But what we can see here, what we can glimpse from these verses in Ecclesiastes, from the mind and heart of King Solomon, that what is occurring today has already happened once before, at least once before. And that's the tie-in of what's going on today to the Tower of Babel and even in the run-up to Noah's flood. If we look at what's happening today with technology and all the developments, we have we man, mankind is is redeveloping is is uh, reinventing the Tower of Babel. The the uh, the ancient mysteries, the secret societies, have always maintained the ancient records and the ancient wisdom. But when that last time, that Tower of Babel, when God came down with His forces and brought the tower down, that means the technologies of their day, brought it down, and basically reverted mankind back to caves and open fields and confused the language. It set back mankind by thousands of years. That is, it would take mankind thousands of years to re rebuild, to recapture what he once had before. And we are now at that time, once again, where the Tower of Babel and all of those technologies are re-emerging. The secret societies that that were there with King Nimrod as the Antichrist of his day, those secret societies have maintained, they kept the ancient records and all the lineages, they kept that in secret, waiting for the time when mankind would redevelop technologies so that these secret societies could make use of those those uh, technologies to advance to the point of where we are today, to advance to the point where, where King Nimrod was, to advance to the point of having a tower that reaches unto the heavens and beyond. And what we're getting to, where all this is headed towards, is Lucifer's original five I wills, I will, that is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. Okay, Lucifer said his five I wills. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. That's where the Tower of Babel technologies are ultimately headed towards, is Lucifer's original five I wills. Do you see that? Okay. Now, in verse 15 it says, Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit, and those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities, who did not allow his prisoners to go home? If you're seeing what I'm seeing in these one, two, Three, four, five, six. These six verses, if you're seeing what I'm seeing. Lucifer made the earth tremble, and he shook the kingdoms that existed here. There were kingdoms that existed here before mankind was ever here. Or one might argue mankind was already here. That's well, that another would, argument. That would but be who, Le, Atlantis ahead. and Lemuria, wouldn't it? And, yeah, and yeah. Her. Okay. And, whatever and, was yeah. here, Whatever was here, there was life here. This earth was teeming with life and with intelligent life forms, however you want to explain that, that was that were kingdoms here. And kingdoms means civilization. It means technologies. It means trade. It means all the things that we see today existed back then, before the Luciferian Rebellion. But the world was made like a wilderness, and that gets us back to Genesis Chapter 1, verse 2. And the earth became 
became <laughs> without form and was void of life. It became like a wilderness, void, void of life. It had been teeming with life. Now it was void of life. Right here in verse 17, like a wilderness. And Lucifer and his rebellion overthrew the cities that existed here and did not allow the prisoners to go home. Ladies and gentlemen, are you and I the prisoners that he did not allow to go home? Was mankind, did mankind have a pre-existence and was caught behind enemy lines and he did not allow us to go home? And Jesus had to come to rescue us, to allow a way of escape so we could go home? Is that a big bingo or what? I mean, is this making sense or am I out in left field? <laughs> All right. I'm not getting any feedback. Anyway, Lucifer's rebellion, his fall, because he did not want you and me to rule over him. He did not like that plan. He didn't want to be put under our feet. He had been the first created. But what he did not know is what the words were, what the sacreds were that created him. Since he was the first created, everything after him, he witnessed. He was a witness to everything that came after him. He saw it. He heard it. He witnessed it. And it was all placed under his rulership. He, he was the anointed cherub that covereth. us. The anointed cherub that covereth is from Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 19. Mm -hmm. So he witnessed all that. He witnessed everything and everything and everybody else that was created. He witnessed it and he even helped out. So the sacred words that were used to create everything and everybody else, he knows those words. But he does not know the words that created him. Consequently, he's tapped into our science in our realm that deal that uh, goes back right over there to Switzerland to the CERN experiments, C E R N, the CERN experiments, to try to find the fifth particle, the God particle, so that he can unwind, undo. This leash that you made mention at, at the beginning, John, you made mention that God put Lucifer on a long leash. He wants to get off that leash, that leash, and he wants to find find the words that can be spoken forth that become a mathematical sequence that becomes uh, set forth in an equation that will unlock the stargates, unlock the wormholes, unlock the limitations that God put forth on day one, that put the limitations that God put forth upon darkness on day one, when God said, let there be light. You know, that's really fascinating that you brought that up, because I, um, uh, when I had listened to, um, I paid 30-some 30, 30 bucks, 30-some odd bucks uh, a couple of years ago during the whole Elenin thing, uh, the uh, Project Camelot people had brought on uh, Dr. Robert Farrell and um, uh, just a big lineup of some really great thinkers and such. Uh, and they had had this uh, basically an Internet-based consortium, uh, a, works, a facilitated work session where they discuss things and bounce, you know, like a roundtable. And anyway, uh, it had been brought forward that um, the House of Windsor, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth, um, no pun intended, flying fiery serpents, amen, praise Jesus, um, had submitted or pr contributed, if you will, over $20 billion to the CERN project. And, um, uh, and I, uh, and evidently, um, according to those who were, you know, privy to it and involved behind the scenes, it had surfaced that the motivation was that they had hoped to uh, be able to open up 
basically a type of a, a very large, well, for lack of a better term, I guess a wormhole or black hole or some some kind of a, a time space, a bend, a time warp that was sizable enough to allow the Earth to move out. This is this is almost a direct quote out of the way of incoming unfriendlies. Yep. <laughs> They're not very friendly to uh, the shape-shifting shift, lizard people here. <clears throat> Payback is going to be a you-know-what. So on day one, when God said light... The way I read that, that means God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He doesn't have to speak forth light, because he is the light. So what's going on here in in, uh, this third verse on day one? God is speaking forth his light. He's reaffirming his sovereignty over this new enigma called darkness. He's exerting his sovereignty over Lucifer, who's now become Satan. He's exerting his sovereignty over the fallen one-third that followed Lucifer and created all this havoc throughout creation. Havoc and destruction, as well as those created beings that were now behind enemy lines. God put limitations in place on day one, day two, day three. God put limitations upon this far and no further will you go. I'm going to put you, Lucifer, in a sandbox. But you do not have free reign to do whatever you want within this sandbox. There's going to be certain limitations. I got to jump in. The, the, the um, Chuck Misler had made an interesting point in one of his teachings where he he was he was uh, musing. He was kind of chuckling to himself. He said that when um, he uh, when 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 he did his research on how the um, bloodline of Jesus uh, over the years was. Um, attacked by the devil um, through various situations and happenstance and, and things that occurred on earth uh, when you when you track it it's really fascinating because you can see this almost back and forth going on this cat and mouse game going on between God and the and Lucifer whereby um, the well as much as Misler puts it he 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 jokingly says that he imagines God up there in heaven kind of going, ha, 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 Lucifer, okay, now watch what I do now. And then he, you know, uh, shows how the bloodline just kind of shifts over to somebody else and then ultimately comes up through through uh, Mary and then and then uh, stays untainted through the birth of Jesus. And um, he, he, he portrays it. Uh, Misler portrays it as almost like a kind of like a cat and mouse game of uh, God at war with Lucifer in a in a near real time dynamic. Is that kind of what you're submitting? Is sort of like going on where by this sandbox where the where the father allows Lucifer to to get so far and then just kind of because you know I find it fascinating that the CERN accelerator has had a lot of well you know, accidents over the years. Yep. It's probably because uh, they don't yet have a perfect working knowledge on how to open uh, the ultimate Stargate or this ultimate go through the ultimate black hole or ultimately do this or that. They still have to work out some uh, details of their equations. But if they are successful... It will not bode well for mankind. Whoever's, whoever is here at that time, it will not be a pleasant experience. All right, so on day one, day two, day three, we see on day one, God separates the light from the darkness. Day two, he separates the waters from the waters. Day three, he separates the lamb from the waters. 
separate. The word separate is an act of judgment. It's not an act of creation. It's an act of judgment. The first three days of of what we call creation are, in, in a real sense, three days of judgment. The six days of creation story is more accurately the six days of restoration of what was corrupted. What used to be in perfect, pristine condition is now corrupted. Now God has to restore it. Just like if a house partially burns down, you go in and re, you remodel the house. It's not perfect anymore, but it's remodeled to make it look like maybe it's perfect. So it's good, but it's not perfect because there's still things that have to be done during this duration of time. The perfection is not accomplished until towards the end of Revelation. So God, in his patience, in his ever-loving mercy and patience, he has patience and mercy and endureth forever because of his great love. When he created all of creation, he put he poured his love into everything and everyone that he created, was built into everything that he created, and everyone he created was his love. But now there's this problem with darkness and hatred and lack and war and devastation, and he has to deal with it. He has to work through this. And mankind was quite possibly caught behind enemy lines, and he had to work out a way to get mankind back because mankind originally was meant to rule and reign with with his son, all of mankind, not part of mankind. But now the contest was on. Now the war for the souls of mankind was on, and how is that going to play out? So God goes through these six days of restoration. On the six days, he he brings forth mankind. Um, And we read the rest of the story. But the rest of the story within the first 11 chapters of Genesis are very cryptic. They're mysterious. They they tie back into uh, Daniel chapter 12 that there will be the future time that the uh, future events, will uh, the prophecies of the Bible will be revealed to us. But likewise, antiquity, that means the first 11 chapters as well as other verses throughout the Bible and other chapters will be opened up to our understanding so that we can deal with what's coming. Okay, God does not want us to be devoured. He doesn't want us to become a happy meal by one of these flesh-eating freaks. <laughs> Lizard creatures, Lizard flying creatures fiery that are coming. serpents, dragons he of Arabia. <laughs> he doesn't want us to become a happy meal. He wants us to be strong and stand back, stand firm. <laughs> I don't want to be a happy meal either. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Even, even, okay, before all that happens, even our day-to-day mundane life that we live right here and right now, this life itself can devour us every day, every moment of the day. It can just consumes people, and we see it. God doesn't want us to become a happy meal to, to life itself, to the downturns, to the bad experiences. He wants us to get a leg up, to have victory, to become more, more than a conqueror. He wants us to become an overcomer. And through Jesus, he's given us the tools to work with, through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, to rise, rise up and take our proper place that we were always meant to, to, to be in. But now we're behind enemy lines, and we've got a war to fight, this constant battle that we, that we fight. And we've got this flesh. We're in this flesh body, this host body. Okay? As you've mentioned many times in your shows, we live in a host body. Okay? This host body is configured to operate, to function within this three-dimensional reality that we live in. We also have a soul body. Our soul body can leave our host body, our host flesh body. Can We can leave our host. You know, some people have trained themselves that their soul can leave their body and travel all over the place. It's called astral projection. They can even go forwards and backwards in time and then come back into their host flesh body. But ladies and gentlemen, there's even a higher body. It's called our spirit body. And when we become born again, we become reconnected with our spirit body. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Through the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, 
especially and then when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, the power from on high reactivates our spirit body. But now we come to where we have to renew our minds in Christ Jesus. We have to renew our minds because our minds have been been polluted and corrupted by the world and the world system and we have subjected ourselves to our host flesh body and its desires. So in order to gain advantage, in order to win this war, to be overcomers, we have to retrain ourselves, which is not easy process, we have to retrain ourselves to have the mind of Christ and to learn the scriptures and that at times, just like Jesus did, the world, maybe even somebody in the church will, will say something to you that you will know in your spirit is the wrong thing and you'll have to know your scriptures that, that just like Jesus said to Peter, get thee the behind me, Satan, just like Satan fired back three times to, to Satan's three times, Scripture versus Scripture. Because as we get closer and closer to these last days, this ties into what Tom Horn has been talking about recently, about Christians versus Christians. Okay, There'll be the foolish versions versus the wise versions. Uh, virgins. The, the foolish virgins will use Scriptures to try to trip up and subjugate the wise versions Onto a wrongful conclusion, so that the wise virgins cannot have their inheritance, cannot be the bride of Christ, and miss out on the rescue mission. So that kind of goes back to separating the sheep from the sheep, Ezekiel thirty-four seventeen, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's a scary... You know, we understand separation of the goats from the sheep. Yeah. We understand... But when it comes to the sheep from the sheep, that gets really personal and really scary. That makes me ask, am I a wise virgin or am I a foolish virgin? Which also tracks over to... um First uh, John um, 5.18, he who is born of God does not sin. He keeps himself, and the evil one does not touch him. That yes. is a fully yeah. loaded verse. That is a verse that yeah. says we, we inspect, we hold, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, we hold every thought captive. We, we inspect every thought, yeah. and yes. we check it against not yeah. only the Scripture, but whether or not it's coming from the love of Jesus Christ in our heart. All of our yeah. behaviors, all of our thoughts, everything we think, every single word that we type into an email, if it's not coming from the love of Jesus, it's not coming from God. Yeah. <laughs> Which means it's coming from the dark side. Yeah, could be. <laughs> that's, that's where I'd put my money, yeah. And you mentioned many times is, is um, he who practices righteous is righteous, okay? Becomes righteous, all right? So that's another angle, too, is... So we can get tripped up, well, gee, I, I sinned today, so does that mean I'm, I'm not going to make the rescue party? Does that mean I'm going to be separated as, as, an un, as a foolish virgin? Does that mean I'm going to hell? I've been down that road before uh, many years ago when I got tripped up over that, and, uh, and God had to set me straight. And this was coming from well-meaning Christians, but it was tripping me up. And so Satan was taking the very word of God and tripping me up, trying to convince me that, well, you know, you're, you're involved with some sin here, so no, you, you're not qualified to be a Christian, and you're going to be cast in the outer darkness, and you're going to hell. You have no hope. There's probably people listening tonight here on, on this show that are tripped up in their thinking. They're tripped up in their hearts, their spirit. They think that God has got it, that God just cannot accept them. But that's a lie from Satan. He does not want you to make... The rescue party, he does not want you to inherit your original destiny. He does not want you to rule over him. He hates you with a, a, with a, um, a rage that no, no human being can possibly fathom, the rage that Satan has for mankind. 
if you look into the sun, I don't mean literally look into the sun, but it, you know, some of these photographs that uh, NASA gives us of the sun and this uh, this big ball of, of fire up there, okay? And you see the, the churning and turning of all this fire going on in that big ball of fire. And just meditate on that for a while and imagine a, a, a million quadzillion times that that represents the rage that Lucifer, Satan has towards mankind and towards the Godhead. Wow. So don't believe anything that Lucifer, Satan, would want you to believe. Believe God. Believe his word. He sent his son into this world to rescue us from behind enemy lines so we could get redeemed and saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost so we could have victory so that we could have our original destinies restored and rule and reign with his son over all creation. Does that make sense? <laughs> oh yeah, amen. Praise God. As a matter of fact, um I think you you hit the nail on the head. The the, the number one thing that happens when uh when you run across a ministry like this one which preaches um you know righteousness holiness and fire and brimstone uh is the devil will make you feel like you can't make it and that's, that's one right. of the reasons why I know I went through it myself it was horrible yeah. and yeah, uh, I mean I lost sleep I was down on the I was downstairs sitting in the I cried I was I was downstairs in the in the recliner I remember just bawling my eyes out because and then I would repent I repented of the same sins over and over and over I'm so sorry I'm so sorry yep. I'm so sorry and um it you know for me it was a phase that I had to go through before the Lord was able to before I was able to emerge from that and understand that it's you know one of the things that I try to tell people who are who are hopelessly addicted to certain drugs or they're addicted to cigarettes or they have some kind of an addiction that they can't seem to, to win the battle over is is I try to point out that he who practices righteousness now I'm not making up an excuse I am not telling you to continue to sin or to use that as an excuse to continue to smoke or to continue to do a drug that you should not be doing I am warning you that if you do not seek medication medical attention and do everything you can to fight the good fight from the bottom of your heart you risk potentially being left behind i'm not saying you will be but i'm warning you you could be i don't know what the rule is none of us knows what the break off point is but i would submit that it's possible that if you have a legitimate medical problem or a legitimate addiction or maybe you have a past with uh, some kind of a strong opiate drug where you need you know uh help from the you know as long you need to seek medical try Fight, overcome, pray, plead the blood of Jesus Christ upon yourself. Fight against the forces of darkness. Rebuke the devil and he will flee from you. But don't sit around and just make up excuses and continue the aberrant behavior and try to hide it from the Father and pretend that it's not a sin. Confess the sin before the Lord. Get on your knees before him and say, Father, I'm having trouble with this. I'm afraid. Seek the Lord. Tell him I need help. Plead the blood of Jesus on you and go to the doctors and get help. Get Chantix. Stop smoking. It's a sin. You're not allowed to do bad things to your temple. Well, I, you know, folks, I, all I'm saying is that you've got to do everything in your power, everything in your power to beat that addiction, to beat that devil. Get help from medical professionals. Do what you have to do to win the fight. Unplug your computer. Get yourself net nanny. If you're if you're getting sucker punched by the devil and sucked into porn or whatever it is that's your your, your temptation du jour, you know, fight against it. Have somebody go in. You know, listen to Bill Weiss. Twenty three minutes in hell. Bill. Weiss, 23 minutes in hell. It's called aversion therapy. You have to understand that the wages of sin is death, and that death is eternally in the pit. We have to know what we're up against. But you also have to know that the Lord doesn't want any of us to perish. We know the thoughts that you think about us. Not thoughts of evil, but thoughts of good to bring us to an expected end. Praise Jesus. All you have to do is fight. And, 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 do, and you know, look, look, even James 4, uh, James uh, 4, verse um, 
Let's see if I can find it real quick. It's so so awesome. I've been trying to memorize it. Um, yeah, it's right in the same um, uh, scriptures that we were sharing earlier tonight. Um, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's James uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. There it is. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. To you, it's all about how determined you are to fight that fight. I don't know for sure, but I would submit that it is possible that up until the very point where that ark door closes, that's the point where the final sheep has been separated from the final sheep and the determination of the wise virgins versus the foolish virgins has been finally made. That if you're fighting as hard as you can and you're repenting and confessing of your sins before God and you're seeking a medical attention and you're doing everything you can to turn away from that sin and change your, your behaviors, that it's possible the Lord will, I mean, confess of your sins before God. He it. is faithful yep. and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Amen? Even, even if you're like the thief on the cross where you only have moments left to live. The thief on the cross did not have time to go to church, did not have time to go before a pastor or a priest or a, a, a rabbi or anything. He had to talk directly to Jesus. And that might be the last moment of your of your life before the ark door closes. You have to go before Jesus, whether you're on your knees, whether you're driving a car, whether you're uh, uh, in a boat or a plane, wherever you are, it's that moment the Bible says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. You cannot guarantee your tomorrows. All you have is today, this moment. If God is calling you unto repentance right now, then repent. If he's calling you, you have to repent again tomorrow, repent. Jesus came into this world to rescue you and me from Lucifer's destruction. He came to rescue mankind that ever anybody who turns to Jesus and becomes born again will have their original destiny restored and their original place within Christ restored to operate and function. And the reason that God has held back final judgment for so long is because of his great love for his creation and specifically for you. He's waiting for you to come to him through his son at the foot of the cross. It's the cross you have to come to. That's the dividing line. There's no other way to come to Jesus but by the cross. And that's the same challenge he laid before the rich young ruler is to take up your cross and come follow me. How many people are going to walk away like, like the rich young ruler? But there's going to be some who will lay down their whole lives, and they will take up their cross, and they will follow Jesus. Amen. Praise God. And we're down to the five-minute mark before we get cut off. Uh, Brother uh, Brother Peterson, would you go ahead? Again, we're going to be doing Saturday night uh, pre-recorded shows at 8 p.m. of the Peterson Chronicles and continuing this. Praise Jesus. And uh, Brother Peterson, did you, didn't, did you not set up a special email uh, account where people can send email questions to you, Brother? Yeah, the Peterson Chronicles at gmail dot com, and that's P E D E R S E N, right? That's right, and it's all word, one word. The Peterson Chronicles, all one word, small letters, at gmail dot com. Yep. All right, praise God. All right, thank you, brother, for joining us tonight. Again, we're down to the four minute before we get cut off, Mark. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that this show has edified, that it has made people excited about the mysteries in the Bible, to help us to understand that there were ancient times, ancient errors, supernatural times, Luciferian rebellion, angel wars that occurred, uh, that the Shamayim that is mentioned in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures is in fact outer space, that Lucifer is a real being, that we are dealing with a real war, Father God, and that our rest 
restoration to our original estate is a very exciting time. That ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is much bigger than we have ever imagined in our wildest dreams, Father God. And we just thank you for that. We praise you, Father. We thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, I pray that every single person that has been edified and touched by this show will send out the links. Let's get everybody involved as we can. Let's go ahead and bring in as many sheep as we can and get everyone into the camp with the wise virgins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Peterson. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank we'll you. Saturday night. God bless. Amen. You.